I'm the Chief Executive at Medilink, and it's my pleasure to CPI to welcome you to this, the first in our webinar series on digitizing medical devices. <coughs> we are delighted that we have nearly 100 delegates registered across our three webinars today and the two on Thursday. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers who have given their time freely to share with us their experiences on this important topic. Firstly, to give some background to this webinar series, it is becoming evident that the demand for digitized medical devices is on the increase, both in the NHS and within healthcare delivery organizations across the world. In our daily discussions with medical device companies, it has become evident that whilst they acknowledge this changing environment, many are scared off by what they believe to be insurmountable challenges such as security and information governance, regulation, and perhaps the lack of internal technical know-how. And yet, an increasing number of connected medical devices are coming onto the market, which are improving patient outcomes and driving sales and profitability for the companies that develop and supply them. So the overall purpose of this webinar series is to demonstrate through practical case studies from companies how they have overcome challenges to successfully place digitized medical devices on the market. It will also provide clinical professionals with an understanding as to the state of the possible. So this morning, this first webinar is intended to set the scene for developments and the direction of travel within the NHS for digitized medical devices. Um, before we start, I'd just like to make the point that following our three speakers in this morning session, there will be a Q&A session to allow you to ask questions pertinent to your own situations. I should point out that the microphones for the audience will remain muted throughout. So if you would like to ask a question, please do so through the Q&A function. And I will do my best to ensure that they're presented to our speakers. So with that, I think you should make a start. Um, we're delighted to have with us our introductory presentation from Lisa Hollins. Lisa is the Director of Innovation Delivery at NHS X. And Lisa will be speaking on the direction of travel for medical device connectivity within the NHS. Uh, Lisa, could I ask that you unmute and share your screen and I will then hand over to you. Lisa Hollins. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'm really delighted to be here. So I'm going to put my slides up in a, in, in a second, but I just wanted to say a few words beforehand. And firstly, um, just to recognise uh, and acknowledge the contributions that um, that uh, medical devices and that medical technology has made in the NHS over the last um, uh, 72 years since the inception um, of, uh, of the NHS, but also more recently um, during the last six months. So we know, you know, um, that it's been absolutely integral to providing services uh, during this most difficult time. So we, we welcome the opportunity to work with you. Um, I'm really pleased to, to be here. And I'm going to say a few words about um, the direction of travel um, for the NHS. What's come out of the, the last um, six months um, and how I see it's uh, accelerated some of the innovation and digital changes in the NHS, which I think um, we are all um, welcoming. So I'm just going to pop um, my um, my slides up um, and um, um, I hope um, you can see, um, see those now. So I'm just going to start by saying a few words about me, why I'm here and why I think this is really important. So this is my 29th year in the NHS now and for most of my career I've been managing managed four A&E departments, two big trauma centres and a very large cancer unit and, and that prior to uh, <clears throat> Uh, and that's my operational career within the NHS. And then I moved um, to um, um, director post uh, within hospitals. <clears throat> and my last post <clears throat> was managing the technology department at King's, King's College Hospital. Um, and what I've learned is that it's so important to 
providing uh, high quality healthcare in the future that we understand technology, we learn how to uh, implement it at all um, parts of the health system and we um, make sure that we can offer the full spectrum um, of services for the patient um, that they enjoy in other sectors um, such as um, some of the retail um, and other service sector. So we can make a huge um, difference and I wanted to be part of that. So that's why I joined NHS X just um, over um, uh, just over a year ago. And I've been really uh, impressed over my career by some of the, the uh, uh, um, in, uh, inspirational people that I've worked with and the acts of kindness um, every day by health service um, members of staff, my colleagues. Uh, but in terms of healthcare, we can't do it alone. We need to work really closely with the, with companies who offer new innovations uh, and use that to drive um, new models of healthcare. And that's what um, we should be doing <coughs> increasingly over, uh, over the next um, decades. So I'll say a little bit about NHS X, because I think this is a... Uh, a really hopeful um, agency and, and group of people who are looking to transform the NHS. And we were brought together just over 15 months ago. And prior to NHS X, the digital strategy for the NHS um, was held in the Department of Health and Social Care, parts of NHS England, um, in a range of disparate places. Um, and we brought it together in one at one body and the reason for that is to accelerate digital innovation so the strategies um, is really clear it's in one place um, and some of the areas that we're going to tackle is is to uh, address some of the huge barriers and hurdles um, and um, uh, we started uh, our work with innovators on the day or the week of the launch and um, by holding a large uh, event with um, uh, I think about just over 200 innovators when we were all allowed to go into um, uh, an event space and we heard back many comments around some of the areas that, that impacted um, and how we could help. We heard <clears throat> much around um, med, uh, technology standards, which I'm going to say a little bit more about later, um, the interest in AI and the direction of travel within AI, um, the knowledge of people within the health service uh, uh, and um, how um, we could communicate with people and work together collectively across uh, across the NHS and um, across innovators who want to um, uh, try and share the good work that they've been doing. So we we know um, that there are a huge amount of innovations out there. Um, and uh, uh, just over a year ago, we published a document which was a response to innovators in that we um, responded to the large areas uh, that people had prioritised for change. Um, and I'm happy to share share the details of that. That report. So essentially we set out um, the work we're going to do on addressing those big barriers in medical technology and procurement and other areas and I'll touch on some of those uh, today. Um, so just, just to, to emphasise, I think we're all here because we want to see um, how technology can improve healthcare and certainly over the pandemic we've seen a level of, of acceleration of, of digital innovation that we haven't seen before um, and much of this is, is has been about how we communicate across the NHS but, but the, the large proportion has also been around what devices um, um, where those are situated can we have more um, in patients homes um, and that's been really integral to how we deliver services especially at times with uh, of high inf infection rates when people can't come into a, a hospital site or a, a GP clinic having um, those small devices at home is really is really really critical. I'm going to say a few things about some of the changes during uh, during the pandemic so um, we um, uh, led a number of, of, of changes nationally but I know um, that you will have seen huge um, changes uh, in the provision of your services and it would be really great um, if you want to submit questions in the chat to to reflect on um, how things have changed for you because we'd really be very interested in in hearing that um, but there are a few things that we wanted uh, a changes we wanted to make the first thing was um, in terms of video consultation which is probably the most the most common thing that people have heard about we, we held those in, in a few GP practices there are 8,000 GP practices and then we moved to 97% um, of GP practices using video consultations over, um, over a two month period. There are also other areas which are probably not um, front and central, but if people needed isolation notes, if they couldn't go to work, they needed a, a sick note, so to speak. We did 
1.47 million of those. And we rolled MS Teams out to uh, 1.3 um, million um, staff. We did that in three weeks. Um, and we moved many of our GPs to a, 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 an e-consultation. So it's a um, uh, kind of asynchronous uh, algorithm based um, consultation. So lots of changes that we um, have made um, within the NHS and we wanted to make sure we uh, in, uh, improved on those uh, areas and kept the momentum. And the particular area that I was working on was how we could completely change the patient pathways and move to many more um, services being provided at homes. Um, so when we think about hospitals, certainly when I um, left um, working in hospitals just over a year ago, we uh, hospitals are incredibly busy, as you know, and um, during that time, it was it was a constant challenge trying to make sure everybody could get into outpatients, out, into theatres um, and into our inpatient beds. And it's time really to have a think about how we can turn some of those care, that care on its head with the benefit of medical devices and benefit of of, um, of digital platforms that we have. So I started at the, the uh, in the first phase of the pandemic in, in March, April to uh, implement COVID pathways at home. Uh, and these are um, pulse oximeters, which people know much more about now, <laughs> a pulse oximeters uh, attached to a digital platform um, with clinical teams in the background receiving that information and acting upon it. So we need to think about how we can move care um, from visit-based care that we've been doing um, to date uh, and many people visiting uh, healthcare and, uh, and sites being about um, uh, healthcare being about sites and what, which site people visit um, and visiting those on a quarterly basis to moving all of those at home and all the benefits that medical devices offer such as um, <clears throat> you can monitor people much more frequently at home and um, people are in the comfort of their own home um, and crucially over the last six months um, it's been a key way to continue to deliver services during a very uh, infectious period of time but the huge benefits um, that we've seen and huge benefits are offered to to, to patients in a completely different um, way of, of providing care and one that um, gives um, patients um, the data and information that they can act on if they if they need to manage their own conditions really importantly and also gives um, medical teams much more information uh, about patients. We don't measure people <clears throat> on a one-off um, period when they visit clinic, we measure them uh, much more frequently and have more data and able to offer much more advice on that. <clears throat> So just a few words about um, some of the changes that we've made already. Um, we know there are many um, high profile pathways uh, where uh, devices and, and uh, uh, technology have, have improved um, people's lives. So uh, diabetes care is the most um, prevalent. When we think of uh, um, diabetes care and insulin pumps um, a, a, little while, a little while ago, a fair few years ago, and, and uh, um, more recently, um, uh, much more finessed um, devices to support people with type 1 diabetes. These are people who would have had inpatient care and many visits to hospital. And um, uh, for, for these patients, it, it's life changing. It's completely life changing for their care. Uh, the more we can do of that, um, the, uh, uh, the better. And we're building on a huge tradition of providing uh, long uh, devices for long uh, long term care and that uh, combining technology we think we can, can completely change um, pathways moving forward for patients so just a really quick um, summary of, of um, the remote care pathways that I've been discussing they, they work pretty similarly um, for all for all patients when they're diagnosed they're onboarded um, with uh, an app they input data whether that's bluetooth um, data or um, uh, with a device or um, there, are, there is a recognition uh, systems within the app. This is monitored by a clinical team. This is really important because if people are um, placing data into a system, it needs to be regularly monitored and part of the regular clinical pathway and built into that clinical team's um, uh, daily work. Um, and then we can escalate um, uh, those results if needed. So it just offers us the opportunity to intervene earlier. And certainly we saw that um, during COVID when patients were deteriorating 
um, we intervened uh, much earlier with the benefit of data from pulse oximeters and, and many other devices. So this is really important for us and it's as important to intervene early as it is um, to make sure patients can have as much of uh, their lives as possible living at home. Um, so I'm not going to read all of these out, but I just wanted to, to let you know some of the transformations people, um, women, colleagues were making in each um, region. So I think many of you will be involved um, in these completely changing <coughs> pathways in, uh, in care homes. Um, outpatient uh, pathways for, for people with uh, uh, kidney diseases, um, uh, looking at how we can deliver um, paediatric virtual wards, lots of, of changes that we're making um, across long-term conditions as well with heart failure and COPD. So many changes um, across the country. Uh, and this is part of our work at NHSX that we've given, given a real push um, to uh, monitoring at home with all the device and technology that that creates. And the second area that I wanted to emphasise um, was around uh, how we communicate um, what's out there to um, our colleagues across the NHS. And, and before I left um, working um, uh, in a hospital, I, I led a, a group of um, uh, a national group of transformation directors um, and shared a group called the Shelford Group. And uh, I asked them their, their comments around um, what makes it difficult for you, uh, what can we do centrally to, to uh, make sure it's as easy as possible to adopt um, new technologies. And, and they said uh, three or four things. The first one was we need to know which technologies are out there. If we're in A&E every day, we just don't get the chance to um, to uh, get out and, and find out what's what's out there. We also want to know who's implemented them. So we need some really good um, case studies so we can follow, the, follow those up. Um, and uh, we need to know that those um, technologies have passed um, good technical standards and their, their trusted um, technologies. So, um, so we um, uh, over the last um, six months have been developing what we're calling digital playbooks for every specialty. And I'll just give you some screenshots of the cardiology one here, um, where we um, make sure colleagues know if they're running a um, hypertension pathway for, for cardiology or uh, try to measure um, vital signs at home. We've got exactly and uh, exactly the technologies who will do that, um, the case studies and the, the hospitals that have implement, implemented that already. So we make it as easy as possible for people to, to um, uh, to find out um, what is um, uh, what's happening uh, and how they can implement um, new technologies in their area. So this is really important for us. We've developed them with the National Clinical Directors. So the National um, <coughs> Clinical Director for Cardiology has been really instrumental uh, within these play, uh, playbooks. And we'll be launching them in the new year with the Royal College of Physicians. So um, really important that we're expanding people's knowledge of, of what's out there. We have promised to refresh these um, every three months um, in the first year, um, just to make sure that uh, as new um, technologies become available, that we can make sure we, those get um, placed on the, on the playbook, which will exist as a web page um, on our uh, website at NHSX. And then just, um, Finally, I just wanted to talk about a few areas um, that uh, we are doing some of our major work on in future. And this, this has, uh, this is in response to some of the feedback that we've had from innovators. Uh, we've launched a big uh, consultation on, um, on technical standards um, earlier in the year. So, and that ran from January. Um, we had the first results back in April, and then we relaunched with uh, a whole range of uh, proposals. Um, and the, the um, uh, consultation then closed um, at the end of July. And, and since then, we've launched um, the technology standards for the NHS, uh, and these are designed to improve interoperability uh, specifically um, and uh, make sure everybody has those, those uh, technical standards in place to, um, to link from one system um, to another. And this was the, the most requested um, area by our, um, our, our innovators um, out there. And that's the area for, for um, companies and for the NHS that they wanted to, to see resolved. Um, and happy to uh, send people the the more further details on that if if people um, need to. 
And then it's probably worth saying more about AI. I think many of you will know um, about the AI fund. Again, we launched um, the second round of the AI fund on the, on the 3rd of uh, November, um, and that um, round of funding is live, so you can still apply for that now. Um, and the, the purpose of this is to get some very good use cases of AI that are well evaluated um, for the NHS. And many of you know that the, um, a lot of the use cases now are centred on um, diagnostics, making sure um, that uh, mammograms, um, chest x-rays, all of those areas, the, the um, detection of abnormalities is, is reviewed and, uh, um, and recognised. Uh, and th but there are many other um, uh, uses, as, as we know, looking at um, how we analyse data much better, um, how, how we start making predictions um, for the future. So lots of, uh, of those areas. And uh, as we progress, we have the opportunities to make uh, care really uh, more patient centric. And the more technology we use, the more opportunities we have to, to offer a, a huge range of services um, and uh, interact with patients in, a, in more responsive ways. Um, and ensure that our care is really based on um, effective data. Um, so um, I've talked through some of the areas that we um, uh, that we have done um, uh, and completed very recently, some of the um, areas that we, we would like to do in the future um, and look forward to working uh, with you all and happy to answer questions, which I think will come at the end of the three speakers. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, slight, slight gap there. And uh, yes, thank you very much. There's a, a lot of information you've just departed, uh, at least that I wasn't aware of, uh, particularly excited about the digital playbook uh, for different specialities. The, the idea that quite often clinicians don't know what the state of the possible is, uh, that, that actually providing information on what technologies are out there, uh, how they've been implemented, whether they've passed the standards, I think that's really, really good stuff. Um, okay, so I'd like now to uh, move on. As, as Lisa suggested, we'll take questions at the end uh, of this morning session. Uh, so I'd now like to move on to David. Uh, if I could ask David to unmute uh, and to share his presentation. And the rest, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Can you hear me okay and see me okay? Super, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to MediLink for inviting me to speak today. And, um, you know, this is really uh, important uh, discussions to be held. Uh, and I'm actually coming at things probably from the complete the other end to Lisa. Uh, and I'm at, actually at the, uh, if you like, the whole phase of trying to implement innovation and technology in new hospitals that we're building in Leeds. So I was actually delighted to hear Lisa saying a lot of the things that we're looking at as well. So it made me feel like I wasn't uh, getting things completely wrong. So yes, David Brettel, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Leeds Teaching Hospitals, and we have, uh, if I can advance my slide, um, we have um, been very fortunate to be one of the first hospitals in the uh, first wave of the hospital uh, infrastructure plan. This has got 2.7 billion of government funding to uh, invest in new hospitals and hospital infrastructure. And uh, as part of that, we're building actually two hospitals at Leeds General Infirmary. They're basically two big buildings that are almost autonomous uh, as they stand. One will be a children's hospital and one will be an adult hospital covering around 94,000 square meters, which you appreciate is quite a large uh, undertaking. Uh, and we've got to do this by 2025. So the clock is ticking and it's quite um, uh, exciting, but very uh, difficult time, as you appreciate. But we have requirements and those requirements are obviously to be digital, um, sustainable and innovative. So I've been brought on board to be innovative, which is a great job uh, for me. But um, yeah, it's definitely a, a little bit of a challenge. So what I'm going to talk through now is how we've uh, approached this, these challenges, uh, how we're um, trying to make this manageable and also implementable, because at the end of the day, in five years, and actually probably earlier than that, I have to put this, these technologies and innovations into action in our hospitals. So I started out by thinking about 
what innovation is. And uh, obviously, um, there are lots of different uh, interpretations and uh, ways of looking at innovation, but I, I broke it down to the transformational innovation. And again, we heard Lisa talk about transformational innovation. And this is around, for me, reducing inefficiencies and the waste of what I call traditional transactional processes that we use within uh, health systems uh, and replacing them with this integrated interoperable parallel systems. That can be achieved with digital. The other element of innovation, of course, is clinical innovation. To me, this is the uh, clinical use cases. This is the what should be the agile part of innovation. This should be, we can just do this. Uh, all those new devices out there, new ways of doing things, new equipment, to deliver the best experience and outcomes for patients. And of course, I said two visions, but there is a third vision, and that's, we really need to wow our patients and staff. And, and I think that's really important not to, to forget our patients in all of this. So where do we start? Well, uh, I wish, wish I had the playbook when I started because that would help me tremendously and I can't wait to look at those. Um, but we started out with a long list of innovations. So you can see there, there's, there's a probably a, sort of like a mind dump of all the technologies that are on the market, are emerging. Um, you know, some will come off, some won't, some are clinical innovations, some are transformational innovations. Um, we broke them down into sort of where they apply, you know, information systems, digital infrastructure, digital devices, smart buildings, all important areas, but still quite a lot to get to grips with and, and way too many for us to, to work with practically. So we listened to staff, we spoke with patients, we have um, tried to uh, triangulate uh, what we think are the best bets with what our uh, colleagues and our patients think are, are the best bets for innovation. And, and here we have a couple of really nice quotes actually. Sometimes I got lost and became exhausted trying to get to my appointment. Um, first of all, there should be smart apps for the hospital, which allow you to link into the clinic. There should be smart check-in, check in with the apps to say where you are, and then someone can come and get you from the clinic or the clinic. I mean, these are really um, important messages for us to understand that these practical day-to-day -day issues, just getting around the hospital, are, are really important to patients. And importantly, I think this is an iterative process. You know, we start out with this long list. I've now iterated that down to some candidates uh, for some innovations, transformational innovations. Then we need to go back and see how they impact on our uh, clinical processes and pathways and the new buildings. And then actually start to look at the clinical innovations, how we can use those transformational innovations in, in conjunction with the clinical innovations to, to um, deliver the best for our patients. So transformational innovation, cross-cutting technologies. I think that's the main thing is, you know, the, the clinical innovations are usually specialism focused. It's something to do with cardiology, something to do with renal. I'm looking at the ones where the whole process gets changed so that we can actually start to deliver these, these uh, large scale uh, efficiencies in, in the system. And you'll have heard these mentioned already in Lisa's talk, it's great to see this triangulation, wearable monitoring and diagnostics, Really, I just mean continuous monitoring. Uh, it, it needs to be ubiquitous where it's required. So it isn't just wearables. That's just one element of this. Tracking of equipment, samples and people. We waste so much time trying to find stuff. And of course, smartphone technologies. Uh, ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Uh, many people can use these comfortably and manage their own uh, way through the system. So wearables. Uh, why are these important? They free up staff time. They uh, allow us to m collect information from a range of uh, clinical parameters uh, pretty much continuously or as required. Uh, it may be that we don't continuously monitor people, uh, but it may be that we have a patient to attend A&E, query appendicitis, but we'll send them home with a, an ability to monitor their temperature and, and respiratory rate in, instead. Early warning scores, the ability to be predictive about our patients and, and if, they, if they're getting worse and actually intervening before they get worse. And I think that's really important for me. These, this efficiency is actually better outcomes. And I think they're phenomenal. You know, they are absolutely linked. If we can be, give our patients better uh, uh, diagnostics, they will have better outcomes. And of course, predictive diagnostics, the ability to put a layer of artificial intelligence, machine learning, algorithmic processing, whatever, on top of that data to allow us to go, actually, the direction of travel for this is this or is this, and then act on that. So, of course, data being turned into information, being turned into intelligence. And it's, that's really important that this uh, uh, 
transformation actually does transform into intelligence in, on, in our medical um, decisions. Home earlier, under our care, um, I love the idea of yeah, send the patient home um, instead of keeping them in just in case, send them the home with a monitoring package, uh, keeping them there, maybe not even sending them in in the work first place. You know, if we could um, uh, have, have a, a way of doing that, that would be so be much better for patients, but actually relieve pressure in the system. And again, this is, this is triangulating what, what Lisa said. And self-management, if possible, why not? What, why not just let patients self-manage all the way through using their smartphones or uh, tech as, as required? Now I mentioned tracking, and this wouldn't be one I think people would think of as being a transformative innovation. But for me, this is around releasing time. This is about uh, just those efficiencies in the system that, you know, this, this is not new technology. This, this is uh, already implemented in, in many of the Scottish hospitals uh, for tracking equipment. Um, and my own hospital, uh, we actually uh, have tracking in part. Uh, and in fact, that uh, the image on the right, you can see the, the map of a, a hospital uh, wing. That's one of our hospitals showing where all the defibrillators are. So if you need to find one, you can look it up straight away. Um, and, and we can track infusion pumps, bladder scanners, uh, defibrillators, a large amount of equipment we can track, but it's not properly integrated into our way of working. And that's a real problem. Finding things quicker, we did a survey with staff to see how long it took them to find a bladder scanner. And it can take up from hours to literally days. This is a shared device that's uh, a key element of post-operative assessment, uh, often uh, important for discharge. And if we can't even find them, uh, how are we going to be efficient in those processes? Again, frees up space. Um, obviously building new hospitals, we're challenged to try and make as much efficiency we can about the space. Uh, both reduce cost, but actually um, not to waste space. So tracking allows us to do that. If we, if we knew where all our equipment was, we don't need to over-provide. Um, we have a significant number of infusion pumps in our trust that are in cupboards, uh, in drawers, just in, in case. But they cost money to buy, they cost money to maintain, they cost money to uh, service. So all of those uh, equipment are, if they're over capacity to cope with this uh, need to store, to find things, then that's waste. And that's both inefficient as well. And of course, reducing duplication. Um, if, we, if we have just what we need, then we don't need to duplicate and waste money. And actually, while this tracking is being reported to increase or reduce uh, length of stay and, and speed of discharge, and I'll just show you a summary on that at the end. So, of course, uh, smartphones. Um, everybody has a smartphone. I think the important thing for me about smartphones is that, yes, it does allow people to manage their own um, health care. It allows them to um, have directions on, on how to get to hospital, where to park even, which car park to go to, which car park space to go to. Um, they, they can then um, have a message on their phone to say, yep, we know you're here, we've checked you in, we know what you're here for, go to Costa and have a coffee. That reduces the need for waiting rooms. That's a great experience for our patients as well, because they just walk in nice and relaxed, not stressed about parking, go and sit down, have a coffee. We can then say, um, dynamically communicate with them. We can, we can say, we've had a DNA. You, do you want to come early? We notice you're in Costa. If, you, if you're able, come, come early. Or actually, we're running late. Uh, stay where you are. Here's a voucher for another coffee. Um, so that these are really important for managing our patient experience. Remote consultation that's happening, uh, obviously the smartphone can play a part in that. And there are some apps already, uh, not validated necessarily, but there are apps that already can do uh, some monitoring. Certainly for uh, uh, basic cardiology management, you can do uh, with some uh, additional hardware and a smartphone, but certainly there are apps that can measure uh, respiratory rate and uh, uh, saturation and heart rate using a simple pulse oximeter type um, methodology using the, the camera and the, the, uh, the flash on the back of the camera, uh, on the back of the phone. So uh, remote consultation, maybe we could take that to the next level. Um, Hospital navigation, um, you've heard the quotes from a patient about getting lost. Um, patients do get lost, they do miss appointments, they do get stressed, they do arrive late, they do ar arrive in an elevated state because of the, the stress and worry of making their appointment. So I think that's a really important piece there for our patients is, is this uh, navigation around the hospital. 
and of course providing results uh, the ability to send res results securely to to patients uh, saves them having to go back to the hospital and uh, have another uh, interaction part of this transactional interactions all the time with the hospital uh, you know uh, let's make that easy for them but for me more importantly smartphones are great for those who can use them and um, if people can use them yeah great they probably don't need to talk to a human. They can do it all on their phone and they're used to doing that. Look, look at the uh, online shopping. But for those who can't, we release capacity to allow them to have a one-to-one -one experience. Let's have people in the atrium of the hospital meeting people, uh, greeting them if they don't have uh, digital um, uh, devices. Um, you know, Let's make it so that we can say, you can sit here and we'll come and collect you and we'll take you to the clinic. That means we have this splendid solution to a patient experience that meets all our patients' needs, not just the digitally enabled patients. So I think that to me, this is a really important thing about digital, about all this uh, connectivity, is it releases capacity to put the care where it's needed so that every patient gets the best solution. So this is a blended response to, to uh, patient experience. So, very quickly, uh, the evidence. Uh, it's difficult with innovation, isn't it, to, to have a strong evidence base. And, but it's important that we get that where we can. So um, just some uh, very simple, um, these are commercial uh, headlines. So they're sort of uh, white papers, not necessarily, uh, although evidence-based, some, some of it's evidence-based. So wearables has been reported by one company to reduce uh, length of stay by 10%. That's huge if we multiply that across the NHS. Uh, that is transformative. Uh, to, you know, it's, it's, in my brain, that's equivalent to uh, building 10% 10, 10 more hospitals in the, in the UK. Um, tracking, in, in Wolverhampton, they, they say they've got 0.75 days reduction in length of stay on average. Again, that's huge. 50% reduction in turnaround on beds. Um, you know, these numbers are really um, transformative and, and from tracking, which is relatively straightforward technology to, to implement, you know, the, it's a no brainer in, in my mind. Smart devices, uh, I haven't found uh, strong evidence to date. I'll, I'll be looking at the, uh, the playbooks to see if there's anything in there. But I think this is uh, really important that um, as, as, we, as we keep going, we collate this evidence base and share it across uh, the whole of the NHS. I think what's really important, uh, Leeds is one of the first hospitals in the first wave of the HIP. Um, there are There is a, a proposed second wave. Uh, I think it's 38 hospitals in total. I think it's really important that lessons we learn, lessons uh, that uh, other uh, agencies like NHSX learn uh, are shared widely and we all learn from it. And uh, I think that's really important that we get the best uh, of, of everything. So clinical innovation, um, th to me, this is, this is not necessarily my priority. My priority is to get the um, transformative innovation in. I think then that will release capacity for the clinical innovation. It will give a platform for the clinical innovation. And these are, to me, like I said, are the uh, individual technologies that um, will give the best for our patients. So uh, specialism related. Uh, I'll give a few examples there. Uh, robotic assisted surgery, virtual reality, uh, artificial intelligence. But these, these are limitless. Um, to me, they, they, you know, we could sit here, that long list um, that I showed at the beginning, that, that could be 10 times longer if we started to stretch on, on what's coming in the pipeline. And, and I think the important thing for me to recognize is we can't, uh, for me, I can't go chasing all of those technologies right now. I've got to put these transformational innovations in, which are, um, I think, will release the capacity to allow us to do the clinical innovations. And innovation to wow. Um, I mentioned we were building a children's hospital, and uh, I think that's a, a very um, um, important that we uh, both wow our patients, put them at ease and make them feel comfortable. So avatars to aquariums. So avatars on the left is a, a, a graphic from a company who have developed a patient self-management, um, I call it environment uh, uh, rather than just an app, where they allow a patient to uh, set up an avatar before they arrive at the hospital. 
allows them to uh, visualize the hospital before they get there through uh, virtual reality and augmented reality when they get there. To have an avatar that uh, follows them around the hospital that is their sort of um, persona in, in the hospital. To allow them to set up uh, avatars for all the healthcare staff that they meet to uh, so they are, have, uh, are comfortable with who they are. But also um, th this particular product has a, um, a chatbot um, powered by, by AI, specifically designed for children to help them with difficult questions. Uh, what am I, you know, am I going to get better? Um, what am I having? What's wrong with me? Uh, and I think that's really important because this is gamification of healthcare for children. And I think that's really uh, important because it will put them at ease, particularly with the generation uh, of, of children nowadays who are into computer games and, and technology and smartphones are really comfortable with this technology. I think this is really uh, another transformative uh, way of managing health. And why stop at children? You know, we could take this to adults. Uh, and I think that's um, quite an exciting potential there. And then the aquarium, this is um, from Helsinki Children's Hospital, and it's basically a, a digital screen um, that welcomes them at the hospital. First time they attend, they draw a fish, they drop the fish into uh, a scanner where the uh, image is uh, scanned and then put into the aquarium. So that means that every time the child comes or, or leaves the hospital, their fish is in the aquarium and it, it makes it welcoming for them. It makes they want to come to the hospital to go and see their fish in the aquarium. And I think, again, if we can reduce um, um, or, or increase compliance with our younger patients, if we can um, uh, increase the, uh, improve the outcomes before, because they're more at ease and less stressed, uh, less interventions, less uh, um, sedation, or, uh, I think that would be better both for the patient, but actually is more efficient as well. So again, Wowing is not just about, uh, or wow, it's actually beneath it, there's a very important uh, efficiencies and patient experience improvements. So the elephant in the waiting room, uh, and, and this was uh, mentioned previously as well, about connectivity, about interoperability, about infrastructure. If we don't have the infrastructure, we, we can't connect to it. If we can't connect to it or it keeps crashing and if we can't connect to it, we can't get the data into the systems that we need and, and have that interoperability. So I, I like to think about, you know, we need to be uh, data light, if that makes sense, and intelligence heavy. So um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done about edge processing servers, data repositories, how we're going to manage this data. And, uh, and, and I'm sure there are a greater minds than mine working on this now, but I think this is really important that we, we don't ignore the infrastructure that's been significant underinvestment in uh, informatics uh, and uh, IT in hospitals. And I think we're going to need to, to up that if we want to see the benefits of all this technology. So on that, of course, I'm building a new hospital and it's, this is a, an important point for me. This is uh, perhaps not around innovation, but actually this is really important. We need to make sure that any hospitals we build are digitally permeable. Uh, we have a new building, well, 10 year old building in Leeds. Uh, when we built that hospital had no Wi-Fi in, uh, nor, nor can we get a mobile phone signal because it's built out of very nice, shiny, uh, reflective glass or, or impermeable glass signal wise, concrete and uh, metal. So yes, that's the way we build modern buildings. Uh, and as you can see that table on the right, the uh, attenuation properties of all those common building materials, you'll see that concrete, tinted glass and metal are right up there just below a Faraday cage, which is actually a, a device, a physics device for actually stopping signals. So we're building hospitals to not allow us to use our phones. So we need to challenge that. We need to find a way of making it digitally permeable, either with repeaters or perhaps by having uh, uh, digitally, digital gaps in the building to allow the signals through or by having uh, uh, this connectivity in every room. But we need to make sure that we have a solution for this. And, and again, you know, we need to learn from these lessons, lessons and, and roll that out amongst all the hospitals. So just on building, uh, another important area of building for me that's been highlighted by uh, COVID, but we were aware of this before, is agile space, the ability to flex, expand and surge our space. Uh, and again, the digital permeability, the ability to do that. So this is around just thinking where we put our medical gases, just thinking where we put our data and power, and then allocating space that if we need to surge into it or expand into it, we can rapidly do it without great expense and disruption to the hospital. And I am thinking of offices, outpatient clinics. I am thinking of education space. And perhaps my uh, really important one here, innovation-wise, is um, 
at the beginning I mentioned about sustainability. To me, um, th this is part of sustainability, personal transport. Let's reduce our carbon uh, footprint, but we need to think now about this because we're, we're, there are trials taking place in York, in Manchester. Uh, this will come, I believe, and we need to make sure that we can uh, take advantage of this for patients, staff, visitors. But actually, it like, means that those who do have to come in a car can come in a car because they can park because we don't have the car parks for people who don't need to come in a car. And also it's healthier and sustainable. So I think this is a really important uh, innovation uh, for health. So um, my last slide is to say thank you uh, for allowing me to speak today. And uh, I wasn't able to show a picture of our hospital because we're out to the architects to, to design what it will look like. But there on the left are uh, images from our younger patients who what they think uh, the hospital should look like. And I love the Minecraft one on the top right. So thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was a, a fascinating coverage of transformational and clinical innovation, particularly in the context of such a, a huge hospital build. And I think the point you make about sharing the learning that takes place is so important. And you know, the fact that the, the, the digital playbook could actually have a role uh, in your thinking and in your development uh, just demonstrates the importance of sharing. Okay, so so. It, could I just remind people if they've got any questions for David whilst it's fresh in the minds, if they'd like to uh, use the Q&A chat facility, uh, that, that would be great. So I'd now like to move on. We've, we've looked at the direction of travel within the NHS. We've um, looked at transformational clinical innovation. And now I, I believe that Dr. Mickey uh, Jarchuk, who is the Clinical Director of Cardiothoracic Medicine at the South Tyneside and Sunderland NHS, Foundation Trust will be specifically looking at cardiac diagnostics and I think the presentation is a wireless future so I'll pass you over to to Mickey Jarchuk right now thank you uh, right good morning um, let me see if I can get my screen shared for you first of all uh, oh. Any second now. Uh, so I'm hoping you can all see that. I'll take silence as being yes uh, and continue. If you can't, please let me know. Um, so many thanks for inviting me to take part in this webinar. Um, what I hope to do is be able to share some of the experiences that we've had with connected technologies using a, a real example of a clinical pathway that we're currently working on. Um, and also maybe expand on some of the challenges in clinical practice that uh, Lisa and David have already probably described to some extent. Sorry, sorry, Mickey. Yeah. Uh, could I just uh, mention? I don't think I can't see the the presentation. Oh, I'm not too sorry. sure whether the presentation is live. Let me try again. If you could, should perhaps have another stab at that. How's that now? Any better? Can I ask Jojo, the CPI events person, whether that's visible to the audience? Uh, yeah, I personally I can't, can't see it. I can't see anything. Okay. Teething problems. This is inevitable in all webinars. <laughs> it's uh, the wonders of technology, but we get there in the end. Let me uh, stop and try again. So I've got that there, share screen. I can confirm that it worked yesterday, Mickey. Definitely did, didn't it? Yeah. Apologies. <laughs> no problem. Um, do you want me to share it? Because I have got a copy of it now. Uh, do you want me to put it on the screen? Um, that might be helpful, I think, yeah. Yeah, just um, without seeing what you're seeing, I can't really give any instruction. So I'll start sharing the great, great. That I've got. Hopefully it's the same copy. Thanks, Jojo. Should be. <laughs> So whilst we're waiting for that to come up, um, I'll 
just carry on for now. Great, thanks. So, um, thanks, Jojo. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. I'll, I'll let you know when to, to move along. So, um, cardiology is an area of medicine that's probably benefited more than most from um, innovation, and we've seen really significant improvements in outcomes over recent years, mainly through advances in diagnosis and treatment. Um, the area of cardiology that I'm most involved with is in cardiac rhythm management, and I think it's in this field of cardiology that's really exciting in that, that there's a huge potential to improve uh, the way that we see, treat, and uh, manage patients with electrical problems of the heart. Um, if we could uh, just move on to the next slide, please. So uh, we've come a fairly long way in a relatively short space of time since the ECG was invented just over 100 years ago. Um, and the science of recording an ECG, which is effectively just a, a 3D electrical map of the heart, hasn't really changed an awful lot, but clearly through advances in technology, we've got a much wider range of much more sophisticated tools to help um, diagnosis. Uh, so faced with such a, a range of options, it can be sometimes quite difficult uh, to identify the ideal solution for what we need. Uh, and I always like to try and keep things fairly simple when it comes to making changes uh, and sort of a, a relatively simple three-step approach and just defining what the problem is, what is the solution that we need to fix the problem and then implementing the change. Now, it sounds easy uh, described uh, like that. Clearly steps one and two can, can be relatively straightforward and step three often uh, is, is the challenge. Um, so if we move on, please. Uh, so just to give you an example of a, of a pathway that we're working on, palpitations are probably the commonest reason for seeing a cardiologist outside of chest pain. Uh, so there are about 300,000 emergency department attendances a year uh, with patients complaining of symptoms of palpitation, probably at least the same number again, referred non-urgently through outpatients. Um, palpitations simply defined as an increased awareness of the heartbeat, and it's, it's, it's very common. Uh, the overwhelming majority of patients who have symptoms of palpitations don't have any serious underlying heart problem. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something I'm sure we've all experienced from time to time. Uh, even those who do have a, a cardiac diagnosis, the vast majority of these will be benign, more than 80%. Uh, and, and very few will have any significant uh, rhythm disturbance that requires specific intervention. However, there are a very small proportion of these patients who do potentially have a serious underlying heart problem. Uh, that does require immediate treatment and sometimes trying to pick out these patients and diagnose them can be quite challenging. There's an element of luck involved uh, and it can sometimes be described as, as trying to find a needle in a haystack. Uh, if we have the next slide, thanks. So the conventional testing approach for patients with arrhythmias has been to utilize Holter monitoring, which uh, is, as this picture demonstrates, a monitor that's worn and attached to the chest uh, with leads. Uh, it's worn from anywhere between 24 hours to seven days or more and, and produces a reasonable standard of, of continuous ECG monitoring, uh, assuming there aren't any technical issues, leads falling off, patients uh, taking the monitor off, etc. Um, and the longer the monitoring period, clearly the more likely we are to, to pick out any rhythm disturbances. Patients have to attend the hospital to get it fitted, uh, they have to wear it and bring it back again. Uh, following which it's, it's uh, downloaded and analysed by our cardiac physiology team. The main drawback clearly is, is, as you can see from the picture again, it's not particularly comfortable to wear. Uh, it, it is prone to, to technical faults, leads being displaced, interference, depending on what the patient's doing. Um, you can't really bath or shower practically with it on, so it, 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 it does limit how long it can be uh, realistically worn for. Uh, monitors do sometimes have a habit of going missing or coming back uh, in uh, a damaged state and, and they need replacing or repairing. The other problem from a diagnostic uh, perspective is that the majority of these monitoring tests are often very normal um, because it's a snapshot in time, a relatively short period of time. Uh, it, it is, as I've mentioned, uh, there is an element of luck involved in picking things out. So patients often have normal tests, that then generate repeat tests, uh, which prolongs the patient pathway and often meets uh, multiple appointments and multiple visits, and multiple tests without necessarily progressing uh, the diagnosis or, or achieving a sort of close to the pathway. Um, so we recognize there was a need for something else. Uh, if we could just move on, thanks. So for a, a period of time, we couldn't really find anything that, that offered the solution uh, really in terms of what we needed was something that provided uh, more practical, longer term ambulatory ECG monitoring 
uh, that provided the same, if not better, quality of data capture. Um, so we became aware of the Zaya patch by iRhythm uh, a few years ago. Um, and again, as this picture demonstrates, what it is effectively a leadless uh, adhesive patch monitor uh, applied to the chest wall provides up to 14 days of continuous ECG monitoring. It's fairly simple to apply. It can be sent to the patient directly uh, and it doesn't uh, restrict activities anywhere near as much as the conventional halter monitor does. Um, patients can still wash, uh, shower, and still exercise uh, without causing any uh, disruption to the uh, data collection. Uh, they return the patch in uh, packaging supplied with it to iRhythm. Uh, the data is analyzed using AI algorithms and verified by uh, accredited physiologists in the iRhythm team and the reports available within a few days uh, via a secure online portal. What it means really is there's much fewer visits for the patient. Some patients potentially don't need to visit the hospital at all. Um, and clearly it means less time spent on appointments and analysis by our staff uh, to free them up to um, take part in other activities where there are uh, more pressures. But probably more importantly, the quality of data provided gives us uh, a much more complete and thorough assessment of the patient and, and certainly a much better chance therefore of securing the diagnosis. Uh, just have the next slide, thanks. Um, so we looked at sort of some of the data from our own department, uh, comparing conventional testing with halter monitoring with, with uh, Zion. Uh, we compared 72 hour halter monitoring because practically that, that's the longest I think that most patients can tolerate wearing it for. Uh, and we very rarely request anything longer than that. Um, and, and what we found was probably as expected that, that we have much better pickup rate for, for rhythm disturbances. So uh, our ability to diagnose uh, arrhythmias is significantly improved with, with Zio. Um, and again, bear in mind that most of these are normal, that are benign, and, and, and what we can then do is provide patients with the reassurance, which is important, and, and again, in a much more timely way. Um, for me, as a cardiologist, one of the, the most important things in terms of diagnostic testing is getting uh, fairly strong assurance and valid uh, ability to, to confirm a diagnosis, and that really depends on capturing symptoms and correlating symptoms with any rhythm disturbances. And as you can see, again, uh, that is significantly improved uh, with Zio compared to, to uh, 72 hour halter monitoring. Um, we're much more likely to pick up symptoms, much more likely to be able to match symptoms uh, with rhythm disturbances. And again, as I said, that means uh, clearer, prompter, more strongly assured diagnoses and reassurance for the vast majority of these patients. Uh, so we've got clearly defined problem, perfect solution. And in terms of implementation, that should be straightforward. Uh, if we could just have the, the next slide, please. Uh, so implementation can be difficult, and this is not just necessarily for the example I've given. Can I have the next slide, thanks. Oops. Here we go. Right. Uh, so, so this is a broader uh, overview of, of some of the challenges that we faced when we're trying to account, tech, uh, introduce technology and, and innovation, digital innovation into clinical practice. and. Um, uh, some of this again sort of touches on some of the points that we've raised before. Now, without going into any sort of strong detail about change management, we know that there are people who are resistant to change. Uh, the laggards that uh, we sometimes find a, a challenge in terms of introducing new ways of working. I think when it comes to innovation, IT, technology, there's another layer of complexity to this in that there, there's a strong body of staff and patients who, who you could call technophobes or just don't do very well with technology. Um, although I'm fortunate to work in what I think is a relatively digitally mature organization, many of our staff just aren't comfortable around IT, around technology. They haven't been brought up with it. They don't understand it. Uh, and this applies to patients too. And anything that they don't understand particularly well um, certainly uh, introduces elements of fear, anxiety, and it makes it much more difficult uh, for people to engage with it. And, and we do need to improve education and training at all levels uh, for staff and patients around this. Added to this, if you ask anyone in the NHS what their experience of IT is, you won't get many positive <laughs> responses. Um, there was a survey I read um, from the Centre of Health Solutions that asked 1,500 staff who were involved in digital transformation what their thoughts were about it and what the words they would use to describe it. You can probably guess um, the responses. Um, the repeatable ones were, were slow, expensive and inefficient, and that probably sums up many people's experiences of technology and IT within the NHS. Um, many of us have had very poor experiences of this in the past. And so 
uh, unsurprisingly, enthusiasm isn't too great when, when anything new comes along. Um, although most organizations are now certainly uh, getting on board and, and recognizing the importance of embracing medical technology, it's probably not quite reached the stage where it's fully embedded into day-to-day -day practice yet. Again, in my organization, I've got a very strong IT directorate. We've got a really passionate and enthusiastic innovation team, uh, but, but not all organizations have the same level of support. And even with these things in place, uh, there is a sort of a, a sense of, of seeing this type of work as being a, a nice to do uh, rather than a, and a must do. And, and it's often sort of added on to day-to-day -to -day business rather than being fully ingrained and embedded with it. Uh, as we've heard already, there's a wide level of variation in, in the levels of digital maturity between uh, different healthcare organizations at present. Uh, and sometimes accessing funding to, to improve on this is, is difficult. Um, we know that structures within the healthcare system are extremely complex and not well uh, linked together. We've got multiple stakeholders internally and externally, and, and we're, we're often sort of um, subject to repeated uh, large scale reorganizations. So it's, it's not surprising that the infrastructure isn't really uh, joined up and, and doesn't really reflect a, a cohesive approach to this. Um, so this is difficult and we've heard about interoperability being a challenge, but, but I think people now recognize this. Uh, there are changes being made to try and improve on this and, and it is a sort of priority uh, nationally uh, as well. So uh, again, sort of probably linked into this as well, there's a lot of concerns that people have about uh, accountability and governance. And again, I think this just reflects the lack of having a, a joined up approach to doing this. Um, if the rules and regulations around this aren't clearly understood, then again, this will always remain a worry for people and a potential barrier for adoption. Um, and it goes without saying that funding is, is clearly a challenge. Uh, there is the perception, and, and true to some extent, that, that a lot of this type of work is, is expensive and the potential benefits aren't always immediately realised. It's not sort of necessarily easy to demonstrate the same benefits as it is for, for the evidence-based practice that we, we're used to. Um, and some of the investments needed up front before we, we realize that sort of longer term uh, benefits. Uh, and unfortunately, as we keep being reminded, there is no magic money tree in the NHS. Uh, have a next slide, thanks. Uh, next slide, thanks. Okay, great. Um, so in spite of all the challenges, there is some good news and cause for optimism. Um, we, we know again, as I've mentioned, that there is growing recognition both locally, regionally and nationally uh, the, the technological, technological innovation has, has a key role to play in how we deliver care now and in the future. And, and the digital first approach has been advocated across all areas, and it certainly features very prominently in the NHS long term plan, which sets very clear expectations and timeframes for delivery uh, within the next few years. NICE approval still carries a lot of weight uh, when it comes to implementation and certainly buy in from commissioners. And I think uh, NICE, by their own uh, admission have found it difficult to um, approach technology and devices in the same way that it has been used to for, for instance, uh, new drugs. Um, but again, together with NHSX, there is a very clear process and framework in place now for evaluating some of these technologies uh, and, and NICE can make valid recommendations that, that clinicians can take away and act on uh, as a result. There are some clear incentives available now and funding available to try and support some of this innovation work. Uh, and again, as we've heard about the AI and healthcare awards, Zio has been fortunate to be awarded funding for this. And again, this will certainly help in terms of moving works forward, but also it helps me certainly when I'm, I'm talking about pathway uh, transformation with my senior executive teams and financial uh, directors. Um, collaboration is, is a word we're all using more and more these days and uh, integrated care systems are still at a very early stage but even with an hour patch across Durham, uh, South Townside and Sunderland, which is our integrated care partnership, we're already having conversations about how we develop shared clinical pathways across the patch that dissolve some of the traditional boundaries between organizations uh, and between different geographies. And, and, and IT and connect uh, technologies are gonna have a key role to play in how we do this. Um, we've got support now from our academic health science networks. I've mentioned our innovation teams. And again, they're going to have an increasingly important role to play in how we adopt and support these technologies in terms of particularly educating staff and providing the training that's needed. Uh, have the next slide, thanks. Okay, so couldn't do this without some mention to COVID, which some of you might have heard of. Um, so since March of this year, we, we've had quite a significant change to our working practices. 
and we've been really sort of forced into delivering care in, in, a, in a completely different way um, with new information often being fed to us at such a rate it's really difficult to keep up um, so again in a relatively short space of time we've had to move away from some of the traditional and more evidence-based approaches that we're used to practicing to, to ways of working that, that are sometimes feeling quite alien to us and not naturally comfortable with um, but some of this has involved taking on technology to help meeting some of the challenges that COVID presents to us, um, primarily to try and keep our patients safe and keep our staff safe. We're trying to balance the competing demands of, of trying to catch up with some of the backlog of the previous peak uh, with trying to maintain business as much as normal uh, and also uh, trying to maintain safe, effective pathways, both electively and non-electively for patients with COVID and not with COVID. Uh, and we just can't do this without looking at new ways of working and, and technology offers many potential solutions, some of which we've already heard of in terms of remote consultations, video consultations, uh, diagnostic tools uh, that provide, uh, provide us opportunities to provide safe care in, in the appropriate and safest environment for patients and staff. So we're certainly moving quite quickly towards a, a new normal way of working, um, but a lot of this new normal hasn't yet been fully defined and, and again uh, technology will have a, a role to play in influencing this and how things look in the, the post-COVID world. Uh, have the, the, the next slide, thanks. So the final slide, just to summarise really, I think I would pick out these as being my key messages as a clinician involved with, with transformation and digital transformation. It is it, always start with the clinical pathway first. I think um, if you fit the solution to the problem, not the problem to the solution, this is, this is the right way to do things. If you can make an argument based on a patient's need, which is always going to be the focus, then that's really compelling and it's very difficult then to go against that if we can demonstrate that there's a clear kind of clinical need uh, for change. Medical technology is absolutely here to stay, uh, whether or not we like it or not, and, and we need to embrace it, we need to make sure it's part of our everyday business uh, and that it's fully embedded into our day-to-day -day working. Um, we know that there's those people who can run with it, let them uh, do so and give them the opportunities to do that, but at the same time support the other staff uh, who need that support and perhaps training to be able to get involved with this and engage with it. Uh, technology in healthcare probably needs to be given the same emphasis as biology, pharmacology, physiology, anatomy when it comes to training staff. And I think then we'll have a, a level of comfort that people can really start to get involved with this. Um, collaboration is the key. I think, again, as I've said, this is something that we're doing more and more of, and it needs to be with all stakeholders. That includes regulators and industry, uh, if we're going to make things work and be successful. The landscape was changing before COVID, uh, but very definitely now has shifted to give us a real opportunity to move things forward. There is momentum being gained, and there is certainly a, a lot of focus uh, on looking at how things will look when COVID eventually does leave us. Uh, and there are clear incentives now to try and take on some of these technology and, and try and introduce connected devices into, into the workplace. Um, finally, just keep going. I think there is sometimes frustration that these things do take time, sometimes a long time, and the pace of change can seem extremely slow. Uh, but I think, uh, as I mentioned at the start, if, if it's clinically the right thing to do, um, it's a very compelling argument and, and things will happen if you stick at it. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Mickey. Um, that was a that was a great summary. Thank you very much. Um, could I just ask the panelists to uh, start their videos so that we're all visible for the question and answer session? Um, thanks very much to all. So I will now ask some of the questions that have uh, been asked. Uh, Mickey, just just because it's just come up and it follows directly from your presentation, before selecting iRhythm what other technologies were investigated? And I think the interesting thing there is that I think in your presentation, Mickey, you, you said you came across something, which was the eye rhythm, which in terms of the digital playbook, uh, and, and Lisa suggesting that there's information on different technologies that exist. So I guess in that context, were there any other uh, technologies that, that were made aware to you uh, and that you actually investigated? Um, yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think we started looking at this a few years ago. So, so the landscape now is a bit different to how things were, I think, it's around about 2016, 2017. Um, and it was very much a case of us at the time having to go out and look for potential solutions that they weren't necessarily being offered to us uh, readily. 
Um, and that to be to be fair, there wasn't an awful lot around at that time. There were one or two different options, the names of which I can't remember now, but they didn't really offer us what we needed. And I think it would have potentially been easy to sort of pick something out just to give it a try, knowing that it wasn't really um, what, what we needed. I think as things developed, we started to become aware of, of more uh, options for us and technologies were starting to be made available. We were being approached with uh, things that, that we could try and look at. Um, certainly, I think moving forwards to sort of the last year or two, that there's, there's such a wide range of things. Uh, and again, I think as Lisa pointed out, um, it can sometimes be difficult to, to sort of understand what is available and how to access it. Um, so uh, again, I was interested to hear about the digital playbook. I think sort of having a, a reference point or directory to try and understand what is available. Is it in use somewhere else? Have what, what are the people's experiences of, of using these technologies and can we, can we borrow it rather than reinventing the wheel again? I think that's gonna be really important. Okay, that's, that, that's great, Miki. Uh, and another question, it's directed at David, but I guess it could be of any of the speakers. Um, if, if someone develops a piece of equipment, uh, and, and this happens to be a, a tracking label to help track equipment, but, but the general question, if they're looking to demonstrate something that's new, how do they go about demonstrating to the NHS that they've got something new uh, and potentially valuable in terms of patient outcomes? Any, any one of you? It's, it starts with David, really, in terms of tracking equipment. You know, how would someone... Uh, uh, go about showing you that they've got something that's really special. So, um, oh, sorry, Lisa, did you want to? I'm happy, I'm happy to, to, David, you go first and I'll, I'll, I'll okay. speak up. Well, I, I think you could probably give a, a, a more national answer than myself, Lisa, mm -hmm. but locally, uh, what we're looking to do is set up uh, an, uh, an innovation pop up hub to uh, be a front door for innovation into our organisation to, to bring these things in, both to go and seek them but also to be somewhere where people can bring them. So we've got the push and pull on technologies. Also, we can uh, collect uh, issues from, from our clinical staff as well and, and take those out to companies. So that's our approach to this, but it, it is very difficult. Um, and I'm hoping Lisa's gonna give us a fantastic uh, answer. That. <laughs> no pressure. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, so there are, there are organizations who are around to support people. Um, to do this. I'm sure people know about um, many of them, but, but there's a formal role of the Academic Health Science Network, so, and it's useful to find the one in your area um, because they have the responsibility to link innovators and, uh, uh, and organisations, and, and they'll know all the healthcare organisations in their, their patch. There's 15 of them nationally, uh, and will know who's looking to do this, this type of work. So I think they're the best people to make them aware of your, your, uh, your uh, product or innovation, uh, but also um, make sure that um, uh, they are aware of um, who's likely to, to wish to, to implement. Um, so I think that they, they're the main um, agency to link to and, and to get involved with. Um, the other areas, and I think um, um, this, this might not be as, as relevant because a lot of the people on the call, I think, are established companies. Um, but the, the role of uh, the accelerators uh, in technology, uh, the uh, National Innovation Accelerator, we've had some fantastic products through all of those, um, um, all of those groups. And we did a count um, uh, at the end of last year. There's over 100 accelerators um, who all play a role in uh, making sure that if you're trying to get your product um, in the first organisation is really suitable for, for, for uh, very new products. They're, they really help with, um, uh, with that, uh, making those connections um, and have all sorts of networking and forums um, to be able to do that. So um, even if you're an established organisation, if you've got a new product that you wanted to, to um, uh, make available and, and test, I think they, they are very helpful. Some of them um, uh, come with... Um, uh, funds and funding. Um, some of them are more uh, around um, support and uh, um, opportunities for networking and, and uh, there's, there's many of those around there um, and for people to pick which ones uh, is most suitable to them. Okay, that's, uh, that's super. Hopefully that's answered the, uh, the question. Uh, another question for David, but I think it's more, it, it could be for any of you really. The specific question relates to tracking of medical device assets. 
working across both the hospital environment and the community. So, so the initial question is about tracking assets across the hospital environment to the community. A broader question from myself, um, David, you, you mentioned a lot about hospitals. Uh, going forward, what is the definition of a hospital? How much of that will be community and how much of that would be treatment taking place within a building? So, so that general question of hospital environment versus community and integration, I think applies to all our speakers. Um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with a, you know, a very simple statement. You know, we're working on a premise of hospital without walls. You know, we need to have this sort of permeability as well into, in, across health systems. Um, that, that, that's a, as, as other speakers have said, it's, it's a challenge. But I think, I think we need to address this. Uh, I did note even on, on one of Lisa's first uh, slides about, um, you know, the activities going on. A lot of that was into care homes. And I think that's a really important first step. You know, we have a lot of a patient demographic coming from care homes. And, that, and to me, that's a really important um, first step. But going into the tracking of equipment across uh, from a hospital environment to a community, we, we have this challenge already. So we have uh, equipment that goes from the hospital uh, given to a patient, such as a McKinley uh, infusion pump for pain relief. That will go into the community and we lose them. Uh, and mm -hmm. they don't come back often um, due to circumstances are quite small. Um, so the, the challenge that we have looked at this actually is you can actually do tracking that will go wider than just in a local environment. You can have a GPS orientated tracking. I think there are other discussions to be had though. Technologically, this is straightforward. I can put a tag onto a, a, a pump and I can find it anywhere that's got GPS. The difficulty mm -hmm. is about um, that discussion with patients and, and uh, our, our community about whether they want us to track where the kit is. So that, that tracks where they are effectively. So that's the bigger discussion, I think. But certainly I can locate where a pump is. I can locate it in somebody's house. But whether I'm able to then knock on the door and say, I've tracked the device to your house. Can I have it, please? Is another story. OK, that's, uh, that's good. Thank you. Um, a question. Introducing innovation into the health system requires change in behavior as well as solid data and evidence to show benefit. Mm -hmm. How do you influence behaviour to support the introduction of innovations? And I guess that's a cross-cutting theme for all of you. I'm sure, Mickey, you've struggled with, with behaviour change, and I'm sure that's an issue across the board. So, so how, do we, how do we influence behaviour to support the introduction of community of, of, of innovations? I mean, I, I can probably pick up a little bit on that. And, and maybe as I sort of referred to in my presentation, I think this, this is probably where one of the biggest challenges still exists in that the people's comfort zone, if you like, it, it needs, needs to sort of be, be increased. Um, I think COVID has made a difference. I think a lot of the things that we've talked about doing up until COVID happened, we just find it very difficult to move forwards. And then almost overnight since COVID came on, um, that there has been much greater change at a much greater pace because We've, we've needed to do that. We've needed to bring in some of these new ways of working just to sort of keep the show on the road, if you like. And, and what we're being asked to do now is maintain sort of the same level of quality, if not better, but, but in the safest way possible. And this has meant looking at different ways of working, looking outside the traditional models of providing care in hospitals, looking at remote monitoring, uh, looking at providing diagnostics and treatments outside of the, the hospital setting where possible. And I think people who previously were maybe a little bit resistant to this uh, have now seen potentially what the benefits are. And I think that that's really the way forward in terms of showing that some of this stuff can work and work well. Um, and then people hopefully will, will come on board with it. At the same time, as I mentioned again, I think just training and education for, for this as well. A lot of people find this very alien and I'm referring to staff and patients with this. And although we all have smartphones, there are lots of people that still don't and don't manage the technological side of things very well and we've still got to be able to provide for them and for some of these people and again I'm talking about staff and patients it may be that, that we, we don't push this as hard as, as, as we need to across maybe others. Okay so that's that's uh, an answer from Mickey on behaviour change is that okay with everyone? If um, so we'll just a few comments and I think it builds on some of the comments that Mickey said, which I think is you know, absolutely right. And um, um, so when I was a, a CIO of a hospital, um, 
one of the things I used to get is lots of um, uh, people uh, talking to me about products which didn't quite fit within the clinical pathway. And within Mickey's presentation, what he described was if you are looking at innovation, start with the clinical pathway. Um, to make sure that it can actually be used in in anger so it can be used really in the live clinical service and and that's the really critical things in terms of in terms of innovation and and testing and i think this is really really important and uh, because the one of the biggest uh, bits of uh, piece of comment that that, uh, that we get nationally and, and again when i was in the hospital I got the same um, comments was that sometimes innovation feels very product based um, and sometimes difficult to put those products within a clinical pathway. So we have to move from product-based innovation to demand-based innovation. So as, as close as you can get to those clinical teams to completely understand their demand, that if you're solving a problem at one part of the pathway, it's not causing another problem um, later on. Um, and then, you know, we've got some fantastic innovations, which, you know, we've talked about some of them this morning. I know there's many, many more out there, uh, but it is a real um, tip that organisations that are successful, and we've got lots of them um, on the, uh, the call this morning are those that really listen to that feedback from the, from clinical teams, think about how it operates uh, within the parameters of the uh, environment that they're um, uh, providing that, that particular product for, and it's part of a wraparound service. So that's, um, that's uh, really important and quite tricky to do. So some of the work that we uh, want to, to do nationally, um, and I think this plays into the, the, the work of the, the um, clinical playbooks, which there is a cardiology one that Mickey would be very well pleased about, um, uh, is thinking about how, how, which which um, uh, companies are up for co-creating um, and thinking about some of the knotty problems that the NHS has. And we've got loads of them, haven't we, really? Um, which So uh, can we build on some of the technologies and, and services out there to go one step further so we can have an end-to-end -end pathway rather than a section of a pathway. I think we're at the, the, on the cusp of lots of innovation, but I think it, over the next five years, um, that those changes will accelerate and accelerate and uh, we need to be ready as, as uh, an NHS. And we're doing some early work nationally, which we were hoping to launch this um, um, earlier in the year, but we've had other, <laughs> had other things uh, that we've uh, concentrated our time on but I think we need to move towards more co-creation between um, innovators and healthcare in the future. Okay um, co-creation co-development I'm not too sure if this feeds into the next question but it's a, a question that's asked by many companies uh, what do you do differently with introducing innovations that clearly uh, disrupt the clinical pathway so that that's always a challenge they have a situation mm -hmm. where um, it, there's a disruption to the clinical pathway. And I guess part of that mm. response is co-development and, and co-creation. Mm. But, but any thoughts on that? It's a very, very general question. Yeah, I wonder if, if Mickey might want to. I um, yeah, I mean, I think co-development, co-creation, I think these are things, again, that we'll start to do more of. It, it's mm. perhaps a little bit, again, unfamiliar to some because of, uh, of we've moved from sort of an era of competition and, and, and not really working collaboratively to, to a very different way of working where now we are, as I say, having conversations across different boundaries that, that previously just wouldn't have happened. So, so now I think if, if people can start those conversations early and, and, and get involved, understand, again, sort of going back to the pathways, what the need is, um, that then some of these things will evolve together. I think it's been difficult in the past when people have, have had their own sort of agendas have sort of set out to, to do things in different ways and then trying to bring that together is, is, is very difficult, if not impossible. Yeah. So starting early and, and, and trying to work together is, is definitely the key. Okie dokie. Um, another question, which again is, is um, perhaps it may be more national focus. The NHS has traditionally been focused on treatment when a patient mm -hmm. is at a certain point in the disease pathway, mm -hmm. uh, that they, they can then get care. However, mm -hmm. I see there's a trend towards preventative health. Are technologies being studied uh, and or adopted for pre preventative care to keep people healthier for longer? Mm -hmm. Which is always yeah. a challenge, isn't it? Technologies for <laughs> prevention. Yeah. It's, the big, yeah. it's the big challenge. Yeah. 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 And I, I think there are opportunities um, opening up. And so, so um, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, NICE, are evaluating 
the first phase of technologies to see whether um, there is ev evidence um, it, the evidence is there for those technologies uh, playing in that preventative space. So um, are they preventing um, people uh, uh, from deteriorating healthcare? Are they supporting people to, to keep healthy? So that's that's the first phase of a, real, a more robust review and analysis of, of the role that technologies uh, can, can have. But I suppose on a more, on a more kind of local and uh, kind of anecdotal level, we, we know a lot of technologies um, support patients spend longer in their, their the correct therapeutic boundaries um, and the more information that we give to patients on um, where what what a normal range of is and what that where where they are and um, the more a, a advice that we can give them so uh, we have to put that uh, information in the hands of the the patients and technology helps us to um, to do that so so I see a growing um, uh, growing opportunities for that so people to to take them seriously, they will have to be well evidence based, and that will be either uh, the MHRA or the National Institute uh, doing much uh, much more robust review and evaluation on on those those uh, areas. Um, so, but I think that that is a, a general direction of, of travel. So, I uh, just add to that a little bit. So, I think David mentioned sort of the use of technology to allow us to spend more one to one time with those patients that need need it. And I think that that's very much something we're, we're looking at doing. I mean, I guess we've often had a very one size fits all approach to, to managing patients. We have the same offer for everyone, uh, but certainly for those that can use some of this technology and, and take more sort of interest in their own health, provide self-care, self-management, this gives them the sort of opportunity to do that and very much then focus our resources on those patients that find it difficult to do this. That, that need more attention for the preventive uh, strategies that we need to, to help them um, get on board with. Okay, thank you. A, a specific question for David. Uh, you, you mentioned asset tracking, and the question is how broad uh, does the asset tracking need to be sent to patients' beds or individual vials of medicine, trying to understand where the benefits lie? Um. Gosh, well, um, first of all, tracking is a blended solution. There are different technologies out there from, um, you know, Wi-Fi enabled tags, the GPS tags that can go wider, uh, and also, of course, the passive tags that allow you to do, um, uh, you have to pass uh, either a sensor over the tag or it has to go through a portal. Um, so it, there are different use cases. Um, I would tag everything because we put barcodes on everything. So why wouldn't you make that an RFID tag? And then that will allow us to just automatically uh, asset, um, do audits, for instance, of our assets. So you could, you could literally uh, have a sensor uh, uh, and, and wave it over a storeroom and know everything in that storeroom uh, straight away and it's expiry dates, et cetera. So that, that's around um, stock management. Yes, patients. Yes, beds. Uh, um, mobile uh, medical devices, absolutely. They, they would probably need active tags on them. And I'm talking about the expensive things like shared resources that allow us that we need to dynamically know where they are. Uh, and, and that's what we focused on is that, um, that those high value, well, high value, not necessarily cost wise, but high value uh, operationally uh, devices such as bladder scanners, defibs, infusion pumps, uh, keeping track on those all the time. So I think there's not a simple answer to this. It's a blended solution, but I see no reason why we can't put uh, active tags and everything. Tesco's can do it. Sorry, passive tags and everything. Tesco's do it. You try and walk out of Tesco's without paying for something, um, you know, in some stores, you know, the ability to automatically know what's in your trolley is done with RFID. If Tesco's can do it, we can do it. Uh, one, one final question. Uh, it goes back to the playbook uh, and knowing what technology is out there. How do we actually track and know what technology exists? Who does that? Because I know Medilink, when it comes to supporting companies, we do what we call IP landscaping which is just not about what exists today, looking at research papers at universities, looking at, at uh, IP, uh, we can see what's going to be out there in three to five years time. Um, I'm specifically thinking of David's comment at the beginning that his hospital bills uh, are going to be three to five years on. So trying to predict what technologies will exist in five years, I guess is quite a challenge. So, so I don't know what's out there in terms of corralling the technologies that exist, particularly if we're going to be looking at specific patient pathways. What, what is the process for, yeah. for, for tracking technologies? Yeah. 
so I'll say a little bit about this and, and I don't think that there isn't a, a neat um, uh, a neat grouping on this uh, Kevin so we, we, there are roles for a whole range of different organizations the NIHR and their innovation service and people will know they, they um, uh, have their accelerators in terms from from the kind of engineering in industry people will know Bayes the British Engineering Industrial Strategy have uh, fund uh, a whole range of, of uh, advancing technologies and, and looking um, towards the future um, in terms of the responsibility for innovation across um, pharma, medtech, um, uh, uh, the Advanced Access Collaborative play a role in their fund uh, specific initiatives and they have a role on horizon scanning and we work very closely uh, with all of those groups on that. So, um, so, so um, I think there's quite a number, it's quite a, a uh, there's a lot of players on the field really um, doing um, that kind of work and I think sometimes the difficulty can be gathering all the information from those uh, uh, from those organisations, especially if you're trying to um, uh, advance your your pathway, your clinical specialty or your, your organisation as, as, as a whole. I think the playbooks will um, help, certainly at specialty level. And I think the key thing um, for that, for that, um, uh, those um, playbooks and that piece of work is uh, to make sure they're constantly updated. This is not a static piece of work; it, it's it's um, um, adapting as as new um, innovations um, are made available and uh, organisations start to um, to implement those. Um, and then in terms of, of the future, um, I think. The role of co-creation, I think that is, that is very, uh, that is really important. There's some areas that we have to fix to make all of this work. So the interoperability um, and making sure there are, there are common standards so um, data can flow from one um, system to another, I think is really important. Um, the connectivity, as, as David mentioned, really uh, important um, and making sure that we as a, 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 a country in the culture within health services really prioritise the role of technology and that it moves uh, from being a, um, a, a nice to do to essential to providing um, services in the future. I think that's a really, uh, all of those um, three areas are really important, but there's many organisations playing in the, the uh, uh, field of, of, of what's happening in the, in the future. I think we might do some work um, simplifying those, particularly in terms of AI, while, where we are um, streamlining the guidance across organisations, so across the Information Commissioner um, and the National Caldecott Guardian, just to make it simpler for people to, to um, um, adopt at their technologies, but there's much work to do. Okay, that's super. So, um... Can I just thank our speakers? You've been absolutely great. Your yeah, content of your presentations, mm -hmm. the extra depth in the questions, I, I found it incredibly informative. So thank you very much. So, so that concludes our QA session um, for this first webinar. I would say that it's video recorded, so everyone uh, will receive uh, a, a copy of the video recording. Uh, our next webinar will take place at 1 p.m. this afternoon. And this will cover our first challenge area, that of security and information governance. So I look forward to I look forward to you joining us again at 1 p.m. The link will be exactly as the same as the one you came in on this morning. Uh, and that just leaves me to thank everybody. It's been a really good session. OK, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to those of you who have joined the webinar series for the first time. And welcome back to those uh, that, who participated in the webinar this morning. In our next three webinars, this one, uh, the one at 3.30 p.m. this afternoon, and the one tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m., we will be focusing on specific challenge areas that need to be overcome if medical device companies are to successfully place connected devices on the market. Our session this morning demonstrated the growing need within the NHS for such devices. In this webinar, we'll be focusing on security and information governance. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our three speakers in advance for the taking the time out to share with us their knowledge and experience in this field. After we've heard from our speakers, we will move on to the Q&A session to allow you to ask questions pertinent to your own situations. 
I should point out again that the microphones for the audience will be will remain muted throughout. So if you would like to ask a question, please do so through the QA function on your screen. And I will do my best to present these to our speakers at the end of their presentations. One final point, this session will be recorded and you will have access to the recordings afterwards. So with that, let's make a start. We're delighted to have with us Peter Brady, the Chief Exec of UAVO, to give us a, a practical introduction to security and information governance. So Peter, if you could unmute and share your screen, I will uh, hand over to you. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Um, I hope everybody can hear me and uh, you can see my presentation on your screen. Okay, so uh, working in, in the medical devices industry and digital health technologies for, for some years now, certainly that there are a number of challenges that need to be overcome. And, uh, and one of the most important ones and, and most often uh, discussed uh, it concerns information security. Um, and so to put that in, into context, uh, many medical devices have the capacity to cause harm. Uh, it, 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 it's fairly clear that devices by their nature can, can cause harm. Medical devices are increasingly reliant on computer systems and information technology. And it's the, the interoperability of medical devices that's, that's being pursued to improve outcomes for patients and to streamline operations and, and reduce the cost of delivering healthcare. So there are certainly many, many benefits uh, towards uh, this digitization of health and the inter interoperability and the interconnectedness of healthcare technologies. But health data is no more valuable uh, than credit card information uh, on the black market, which, which leads us to uh, security uh, complications that have to be dealt with, even though they don't necessarily deliver uh, um, uh, any benefits for patients and healthcare providers other than keeping, other than keeping that uh, information secure. So, uh, Software systems and the data they process add uh, immeasurable value to, to medical devices and the healthcare technology. They're enabling all sorts of benefits. Uh, the integrity and availability of that data is becoming ever more essential to the safety and effectiveness of those devices. So if data is corrupted, then incorrect diagnoses might result. Data is not available when it's needed. Patients may not get the treatment that they need. And most computer systems are vulnerable to unauthorized access and to malware. And threats range from terrorism to crim criminal activity to sabotage to the uh, inadvertent consequences of cyber mischief. So it's very difficult to police networks and to keep them safe and secure. So uh, some of the data that's been processed by medical devices and, and digital health applications is covered by data privacy laws and health information is considered confidential information needs to be kept confidential. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, health information has a value to criminals and uh, they, they uh, exploit that information by committing insurance frauds typically. And a consequence of this is that hospital information networks are constantly under attack. So the, the concerns that, are, that, that, that exist about information security in healthcare and health technologies are real. And uh, it, it is something that the industry needs to deal with and it presents a challenge. And uh, we, we've certainly seen uh, plenty of examples in the news about um, medical devices being being very easy to hack and security concerns about connected devices like uh, um, implanted defibrillators um, and and pacemakers so it's something that is 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 coming under increasing uh, scrutiny and uh, FDA in in the US are particularly concerned about it and they've raised lots of concerns with with, with industry so, what does regulation um, what does regulation tell us about uh, information security? What is it that we need to do? Well, 
In the European Union, the Network and Information Security Directive, which is commonly known as the Cybersecurity Directive, was approved by the European Parliament some years ago. There's no specific guidelines for medical devices. Uh, and in that respect, the EU is lagging the US in, in cybersecurity of medical devices. What the medical device regulation tells us is that all known and foreseeable risks and any undesirable side effects shall be minimized and be acceptable when weighed against the evaluated benefits to the patient and or user arising from the achieved performance of the device during normal operating conditions. So it's certainly true that a known and foreseeable risk is that information might be compromised in some way. So that's a risk that we have to minimize and reduce it to a level that's acceptable when weighed against evaluated benefits of the device. So furthermore, medical device regulation says that manufacturers shall eliminate or reduce risks as far as possible through safe design and manufacturer, and this includes cybersecurity. As far as possible uh, does not mean reducing risk to zero, but it does infer that risk control measures are consistent with the generally recognized state of the art. And so that means when we are developing uh, integrated, connected healthcare technologies, then the security uh, measures that we take need to be consistent with the generally recognized state of the art. And for devices that incorporate software or for software that are devices in themselves, the software should be developed and manufactured in accordance with the state of the art, taking into account the principles of development life cycle, risk management, including information security, verification and validation. So that means that security needs to be part of the software development life cycle. It needs to be considered there. And I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about that at, at the end of this. In the US, the FDA are, are more explicit uh, and they, uh, they, they, they tell us that effective cybersecurity management is intended to reduce the risk to patients by decreasing the likelihood that device functionality is intentionally or unintentionally compromised by inadequate cybersecurity. And uh, a, a key a key phrase there is unintentionally. So uh, networks can be compromised by all sorts of things, um, uh, not necessarily intentional criminality. And so uh, technologies need to be robust, uh, robust enough to withstand that. Uh, manufacturers should develop a set of cybersecurity controls to assure medical device cybersecurity and maintain medical device functionality and safety. FDA uh, recognise that medical device security is a shared responsibility between stakeholders, including healthcare facilities, patients, providers, and manufacturers of medical devices. So uh, as a manufacturer, you have your part to play, but it is a cooperative endeavour. Certainly when your, your technologies are connected to a hospital information system, or patients have access through their mobile phones, perhaps, um, so security becomes a, uh, a, a shared responsibility. Manufacturers should address cybersecurity during the design and development of the medical device, as this can result in more robust and efficient mitigation of patient risks. Um, manufacturers should establish design inputs for the device related to cybersecurity and establish a cybersecurity vulnerability and management approach as part of the software validation and risk analysis. So again, it's important that, that, that cybersecurity or information security is addressed during the design and development of the device. It's not something that can be bolted on at the end. So how do we uh, comply with the regulation and meet the challenges that, that I, I've set out? And in the medical devices industry, there is a, uh, a, a need for an integrated approach to to the development of a medical technology that is safe and effective for patients and is also secure. So when we talk about information security, you've probably heard of three elements to it, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And then in the commercial world of, of banking and online shopping, confidentiality is probably the most important thing. Um, but in, uh, in uh, healthcare technology, integrity and availability uh, take on a, a greater importance. This was something that I mentioned at the beginning that medical technologies may have the capacity to cause harm. 
and if the integrity of data is compromised, then that can lead to patient harm. Uh, availability is important also if we're monitoring uh, vital signs in real time and that data is becomes unavailable because of a denial of service attack, for example, then again, the, the patient may be harmed. There's an international standard for uh, information security, ISO 27001, and it describes a framework for the systematic management of information security. And when I talked earlier about reducing uh, risks as far as possible, then the, the intent of that statement is that best practice is followed. And best practice is defined by the, by the international standard 27001 for information security. But this standard was not written with specific requirements for safety critical data uh, uh, applications. So in the medical devices industry, this is addressed through standards ISO 13485 for quality management and risk management for ISO 14971. So when I talk about an integrated approach, it's an integrated approach to risk management, information security and quality management. So risk management, uh, in medical devices deals with risks that can lead to patient harm and identified risks must be controlled and uh, as i've mentioned in the eu uh, be reduced as far as possible which means complying with international standards so uh, we can see then that in order to comply with safety and effectiveness regulation that includes information security and data privacy we must take an approach that adopts the principles of iso 27001 but in a way that's integrated with quality management standards and risk management standards for medical devices. Uh, if, if this all seems very uh, theoretical, uh, the risks seem theoretical. There's an example of um, uh, this guy, Jerome Radcliffe, used uh, a laptop um, to uh, disrupt wireless signals being sent to his own insulin pump. He was able to uh, reverse um, reverse them, swap the data being captured about his condition with false data, and then send it back to the pump. Um, so it's, it's an indication that these are not theoretical risks. It is possible to do this either intentionally or even un unintentionally. So making systems robust, um, robust to information security threats is, uh, is certainly vitally important. So in the software development life cycle, um, there are certain steps that need to be taken, and these are things to, to build secure software by defining security requirements, modeling threats, validating inputs, um, heeding compiler warnings, uh, architect and design for security policies, keep systems as simple as possible, uh, uh, adopt approaches of, of default denial of, of access, adhere to the principle of least privilege, sanitize data sent to other systems, practice defense in depth, use effective quality assurance techniques, that's where ISO 13485 comes in, and uh, IEC 62304 for software development, and adopt a secure coding standard. So uh, a secure coding standard is something like Cert C and Cert C++, which uh, are, uh, contain uh, great guidance on how to develop uh, secure software. Um, and combined with IEC 62304, which will help you develop safe and secure software. So in summary, uh, incorporate cybersecurity into the following processes. It's part of the quality management system, the risk management system, information security management, combining those three uh, ISO standards. It's part of software development and it's certainly part of software maintenance. But you also need to take a balanced view based on risk, um, uh, incorporating elements of uh, usability. Um, for example, you would not want to prevent uh, someone using a def defibrillator because the user couldn't remember a password, for example. In those circumstances, you just want to be able to turn the device on and use it. So it's, it's don't go too far. Um, uh, but focus on those three key areas of availability, integrity, and confidentiality, confidentiality of data bearing in mind that availability and integrity might have a might have safety implications for the patient thank you that concludes my um uh, my presentation and um i'll be around to take questions at the end of uh, this session 
Okay, that's a, a super introduction, um, Peter. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, just in terms of the questions and answers, uh, if you do have questions for the speakers, I suggest you get them up there on the question and answer um, the uh, platform uh, so that you don't forget them as, as the presentations move on. Uh, so now moving on to our second speak speaker, Bryn Sage, who is a person I'm sure is well known to a lot of you. He's the CEO of In Healthcare, uh, and he will be the uh, presenting on tra digital transformation with medtech manufacturers and the NHS. So I will now pass over to you, Bryn. Thanks, Kevin. So I need to share my screen, do I? If you could please, Bryn. Okay, hang on a minute while I work out how to do that. Just bear with me a minute, folks. Come yes, on, Bryn. I've got it. I'm not a techie person, Kevin, you know. <laughs> oh, come on. Surely not. Brilliant. That's good. Up? Yeah, there. that's good. Okay. Right. Is that is that the full screen for everybody? Yeah, yeah. that works. Yeah. As Kevin says, he asked me to talk about some of our experiences of... Uh, what we, we class as medtech and the NHS and, and some of the things that have happened. And I, I would be interested if you can share your thoughts in the chat on how many of the delegates are looking at how to put a uh, digital element to their traditional products. Uh, I'm uh, going to cover three examples of blue chip companies that uh, decided to partner with in healthcare uh, to take advantage of this part of the market. And I think I'll build on what I think Peter says about, you know, companies must recognize the importance in the future, the value of data, not only in terms of a, if you lose that data and what it's going to cost you, but the value that that data could bring to your business. However, before I do that, I'll just a few words about in healthcare, uh, which will try and highlight why uh, I think these, these organizations decided to work with us. And for those of you there this morning, uh, and saw Lisa Holland's presentation about remote patient care. I think in healthcare are one of the leading, if not the leading providers of remote patient care in the UK. And today, more than 750,000 people have benefited in one shape or form uh, from our using our services. Uh, and what we do is we work alongside the NHS to transform how they deliver care so that it, it basically reduces the need for individuals to either go to a clinic or uh, for a healthcare professional to visit a person's home. And, you know, in the post-COVID world, that's moved from being an efficiency benefit to actually being a, uh, a safety benefit. Uh, we work alongside at the NHS so that they, 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 we, we don't enforce how they change their, their, their transform the services. We transform the services to their needs and their requirements, but also making sure that the individual, the patient, is at the centre of... Uh, their care. Uh, through the summer, we've become the chosen partner for Scotland to deliver uh, remote patient care. And uh, we're also experiencing a similar sort of thing in Northern Ireland. And after a bit of a hiatus over the summer, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in England now in, in how they're going to do this the type of services. And if you look at what's in the news around uh, COVID, uh, there's a lot of activity going on in care homes. So we, we have a care home service that looks after patients. Uh, residents of care homes. We address a lot of long-term conditions such as COPD and diabetes, et cetera, and also short-term conditions which might, which might be pregnancy-related or it might be COVID-19 related. You learn a lot of, uh, you've heard a lot in the press if you follow the NHS type stories about virtual wards or the NHS at home or digital clinics. That's the marketplace that in healthcare play in. And I guess my final point, again, just going on what Peter was saying, I just made a note of that. Our platform uh, is, and, our, and our apps are registered as medical devices, currently class 1B, but we're moving to class 2 uh, by the end of March. Going digital. So how has this benefited our partners? Well, uh, the, the three companies I'm going to talk about are Roche Diagnostics, Smith & Nephew, and Olympus. And... They've benefited them all in similar ways, but different ways at the same time. Uh, they've created new markets. 
Uh, you've got organisations such as Smith and Nephew who are really up against it in terms of uh, cheap imports from the Far East and trying to maintain the value of their products. And we're giving them real time data to actually do that. Now, if you are considering uh, looking at moving into a medical device, uh, sorry, the digital uh, area, I think things you must ask yourself is, are you adding complexity to the solution? Because if you are, the NHS won't buy it. Uh, do you understand the costs and the time to market that you're facing? And do you understand uh, what was covered in, in a lot of detail? And the last thing, your data governance, compliance and security issues. Well, we found that it, despite that these were blue chip companies, they really didn't understand the last three points fully. And that's why they chose to partner with us. We operate this software as a service platform, which allowed them to address all them uh, issues at the same time. So it reduced the time to market, it took complexity out of their offering, and we dealt with the data governance and the compliance and things like that as part of our uh, medical device registration. We, in effect, we were taking away the pain for them. So here's the examples. So digital iron, INR self-testing, you measure, if you don't know, you measure your INR if you take in anticoagulants to prevent strokes and uh, Roche had a device that was particularly, it was a consumer device, an individual had to buy it, it was £300 plus VAT. You self-managed and self-dosed uh, your, your warfarin to manage your INR rate, you know, to prevent your strokes. And what we did is we partnered with Roche and uh, County Durham and Darlington uh, Foundation Trust and created a service which allowed individuals to test outside the clinic uh, but still under the care and supervision of their uh, clinical team so that if they needed to change the dosing, an alert was created and it allowed the hospital to get in touch automatically with the patient and say, you need to change your dose to this and can you confirm you understand your dosing? And our uh, picture postcard guy is a guy called Steve Clark. If you follow Twitter, follow Steve on Twitter, you'll know he's into raves and Ibiza and he loves sending his INR ratings from the beach along with the picture. Again, putting the patient at the center of his care, not the need to visit a hospital. Benefits for Roche, they were selling hundreds of devices in the UK, if that, and maybe one, 200 devices. Uh, when we deployed this service three or four years ago, uh, they got into thousands of units. So they, they saw a tenfold increase in the sale of the devices. Benefits from the NHS, uh, the Darlington Clinic uh, will reduce the outpatient appointments by 15,000 a year. So creating real capacity in the system, which is important to the NHS. And again, uh, in the post-COVID world, the, one of the hospitals up in the Northeast that's looking at uh, expanding this service, 30% of their outpatient appointments at the moment are people who are taking warfarin to manage uh, their INR. And it's just taking up far too much capacity in the hospital and they need to find a way of getting them, uh, uh, getting these individuals out of the hospital to free up for people with other conditions that need treating. So a, a win all round, a win for the patient, a win for Roche, and a win for the hospitals as well. Uh, Smith and Nephew, as I touched on earlier, they had uh, an issue around uh, uh, cheap imports that are coming in at a tenth of the price. And if you if you anybody who sells on, on these procurements to certain hospitals where it's all price driven, they saw it as a big risk. So they needed to demonstrate how their service, their, their wound dressings were better than uh, these cheap imports. But also they, they, they had the further issue that the, the district nurses were becoming uh, closer and closer to retirement and the people that were coming through were less and less experienced. So that the app allowed them to do two things. One, it gave a consistent approach to wound care. Uh, and the other is it demonstrated that the Smith and Nephew wounds, wound dressings were more efficient in the long run in terms of uh, you didn't need as many dressings to treat the same wound as a cheap import. But the data also starts giving you insights into how much it costs to actually treat a wound. And if you're a manufacturer of a device, this insight that the data, or sorry, addressing, this insight that the data is giving them means that they could think about changing the business model, which they've not done yet, from a cost per dressing, but cost to treat a wound. And you, you're moving 
the game to a different playing field to keep your competition out. And if you think about what data is all about, if you think about Amazon, they're not a bookseller, they're a company that manages data on their customer base and use that data to maximize their revenue streams. And again, they moved the playing field from a bookstore to a data-driven business. Oh, your zoom off. I've got a bit of a build effect on there that covered my points. Uh, Olympus, they, they, they provide the bulk of the camera. I think they've got 85% market share for uh, uh, cameras that are used for internal examinations of individuals. Uh, when, you're, when you're a market leader like that, again, you're there to be, uh, you, you can only, there's only one way and that's down unless again, you change the value that you add to your customers. So the NHS have got a big problem with people who do not attend. So even though individuals are at risk for cancer, they don't bother turning up for their, uh, their examinations. And the other thing that they do is they turn up unprepared. So there's a, better, there's a list of things that you, you need to do uh, in the two to three weeks leading up to uh, an examination uh, that sometimes people forget to do that or de decide they're not going to do it and they turn up and you have a do not attend. And the do not attend rate at cancer hospitals tends to be about 5%, which causes a big impact on the cancer waiting list because you've lost that bit of capacity in the system. So they, they approached us and asked to work with a, an app that replaced uh, a... 60, 70 page document that was posted through to individuals to apps that drive people's behavior through the build up to their uh, preparations and uh, sort of their uh, examinations. And again, this app starts building up data and information on the individuals. So it's giving you real insight into patient behaviors and the experiences they have. So things that it does is it can, you can start seeing why people do not attend and what, or why they do not attend unprepared, because you can see in what questions they're answering, what questions they're asking and things like that. And then also at what stage do people give up and decide that they're not gonna bother having this examination? Again, you'd think when people are at risk of uh, having cancer that they'd want to know about it, but people are in denial. So you get start building data on individuals and you can start thinking about how you change your pathways, how you change your prep, how you change your messaging. Again, Olympus are, off, are offering a different value now to their clients other than providing a really sophisticated uh, camera and imaging system. So again, they've moved their, their market away from a product sale to a product sale with a big service wrapper around it and, uh, and adding insight and value. Again, it's all around the data to their individuals. So they're the three examples I hope have uh, stimulated some thoughts in your own minds uh, in the audience. and. Uh, I'll hopefully hear from them in when we finish the presentations. That's me done, Kevin. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Bryn. Uh, I think that was, I think your three examples captured this, this uh, area of how do you differentiate your product? Uh, and obviously it's, it, but by adding value to the product, you're going to be much more competitive. Um, so yeah, those, those, I think the other point I took away really is that we're looking at how do people overcome some of these challenges. And I think the point you make that quite often it's just partnering with a third party to take the pain away. You know, that these medical device companies don't have to have the expertise in-house. They can partner with a third party in order for that to happen or for yeah, the development to take place. It can also be an excellent step. It doesn't have to be the end game it could be how you put yep. your toe in your market and decide which way you're going yeah uh, horses for courses i guess yeah okay so so now we move on to our next speaker we we're going we're going well on the on the talks uh, from a timing perspective i now like to uh, pass you over to lee thomas uh, lee is the senior vp and director of global sales for abingdon health and he will take us through a personal experience, the app DX experience, and, and the challenge in developing a smartphone rapid test reader solution. So this is a case study. It's a real life case study. Uh, it's not necessarily completely focused on security and information governance. It's basically 
uh, Lee give us an idea as to the challenges that they faced when they moved towards digitization. So, so with that, if I could ask uh, Lee for your mute and to share your screen, then I'll get off. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? No? Looking good. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, is it on full screen? Um, not there sure. Go. There you yeah, go. That's good. That's excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so thanks for that, Kevin. I, I think it's important um, just give a little bit of uh, background to Abingdon Health, our first. Um, we're a lateral flow technology specialist, um, and we've uh, got a lot of experience in the team in terms of in the, in the point of care market space, um, with the team coming from various uh, previous uh, homes like the Siemens, Ilya, Axis Shield, and, and, and Cozart, etc. Our core focus is the provision of um, contract manufacturing um, and development of lateral flow tests. Um, and that's across multiple different industries and, and, and disciplines, both in terms of human health, animal health, uh, infectious disease and environmental, et cetera. Um, well, um, we developed in, in uh, the AppDX technology in 2019, um, really um, in terms of uh, imaging technology, using a smartphone to read these lateral flow devices. I'll go into that in a little bit more now. Uh, we're based across three sites. Uh, we're headquartered at the York Biotech campus. Um, we've got a manufacturing facility there, man an R&D, a manufacturing facility in Doncaster, an R&D centre in Birmingham. Um, and obviously we operate to your, to your standard quality standards and certifications, uh, being established in 2008. Um, if I go back to say, you know, we developed the, the AppDX, and if I just, uh, important to understand the, the back, background to that. Um, you know, medical devices and classical medical devices have been looking in that area, such as glucometers and glucometers, as, uh, really a, um, for a period of time now, and, and has been a standard approach is just to monitor, um, you know, the existing conditions effectively. Um, and also kind of important to note that while it's addressing the existing conditions, we've seen an increase in focus on prevention. So there's been a, a massive uptake now recently in terms of health monitoring really becoming ubiquitous with the, such as health parameters, heart rate, oxygenation, and other kind of indicators and blood chemistries that can be picked up. And sometimes, and wellness and, and, and uh, healthy living kind of all in, in the art of prevention. And that's been serviced through the smartphone and effectively on your, on your own personal devices. Um, but while we really have been seeing the managing data and, and the of indicative um, data from, from well-being, that's now starting to, to merge a little bit and blur with what was previously a, a, an area of telemedicine. And that's looking at more um, indicative conditions, but not just related on to behaviours or data entry, but actually the discovery um, and actually looking at the scanning and, and discovery of, of markers that can have an impact, such as inflammation, um, you know, your CRP markers or um, calprotectin for uh, IBS. And these markers predominantly previously would be a sample having to be taken, um, increasing the, the need at, for attendance at clinics um, or the sample, which is not a pleasant sample take sometimes, and being posted off. So effectively, what um, with this blurring of, of telemedicine and really patient testing is instead of sending a sample and, and you take the test and send the results, you let the data do the, do the hard work. Um, and it, then external factors started, have started accelerating that in the recent years in as much as health economics are under extreme pressure um, and there's a need also uh, most highlighted most recently, obviously in the last 12 months, in terms of the prevention of secondary infection and, and the spread that you can be taking when you're attending um, doctor's offices and as such. So against that backdrop, um, Abingdon Health, with uh, being a lateral flow specialist, identified the need really there's an opportunity where lateral flow and patient testing and bedside testing linked with a, um, a reader that could be easily accessible was there was a, a growing demand and a requirement for this kind of solution. And that's where effectively we developed the, the AppDX solution. So the first thing was important was that, you know, we, we mapped out a very clear um, technology need really. Um, and central to the lateral flow test, there was a necessity for connected health and then a growing need for connected health. The hardware um, with smartphones are already in the market. So that, that issue sometimes when you develop readers in the, in the lateral flow space, and we developed desktop and benchtop readers in the past, was getting the hardware into the market as well. 
but smartphone were, uh, are already um, diluting the market and so the hardware is in people's pockets effectively. But also there's a need then for a reader technology that offered something else. Um, you didn't, can't just offer something that's, that's the same or, or status quo. There really was a need for um, a reader plus plus kind of technology, whether that's GPS tracking or data, data um, management, or indeed that, you know, even with the use of the, of, the, of the web, environmental circumstances, which much might impact the diagnosis. Um, so this was a real, real point of, point of interest. Um, and what, what you find though, once you get into the, start getting into the detail, the, the, the versatility of the smartphone um, and in linked with the lateral flow test was quite staggering in terms of, and, and really kind of endless. Um, all the various features you'd expect to have with a handheld and you know the, the ease of use and the minimal training, the applications that are available that could be used and, and, and embedded to each other, uh, really provided an opportunity and, and home testing, which was where we think Things are going really were starting to become a, more of a more of a, an, a reality instead of an ambition. Um, so, well, in this way though, this versatility also becomes a bit of a problem. It becomes very much a little bit like a, a very overfeatured um, sweet shop. Um, so it's important really that we define or you define a solution first. So, so those interested in in this kind of um, area really need to think about not going on a tech tech troll or technology for technology's sake, but really understand what you want to achieve. Um, so it, it's, it's really the first question is, do you need to digitize? Is there a need for what you want to do? And is there actually a value to the end user or the, or the, or the customer or the healthcare system that you're looking to, to feed into? Um, providing just data for data sake, and, and you, know, it, you could do that across many different platforms. This is about identifying and going hand in hand with data management to provide a, a, data, a scanning and, and a reader solution that provides a diagnostic result. So despite the accuracy really and, and, the, and the reliable technology, which is proven out, the biggest driver, and because our, our service is, is a customizable service, this, this is for third party, we develop this software, um, and then we, we customize it now for, for um, many different customers. It, the first thing we ask is, do you really need it? Because if you, put, if you go on a journey, uh, on, on the digital journey, you really need to have an endpoint in, in mind. So um, otherwise a project that's poorly scoped or poorly defined um, add, and without the, the requirements can become too complicated. And I think as, as, uh, as in the, uh, Bryn said in the, last, uh, in the last presentation, over complex solutions are a no-no. So the key takeaway really is define your mobile strategy first, really understand the benefit that you want to achieve and the payoff that you expect, because then the investment decision becomes quite easy. Um, also, if we come back, when you're evaluating the technology, what we find, you know, not all those features are required. Sometimes you may only need four or five of those main, main, main capabilities in technology that, that the technologies can offer. Um, and it's, it's clear you, you, you drive down onto that. And, you know, there's a critical threshold then that, that makes certainly a smartphone um, reader solution with, with lateral flow testing, where it really resonates, there's a critical threshold uh, which you move over. And in that, it really does come back to that reader plus plus environment. So match against your, the requirements, match the solution to your requirements. And then um, that then gives you an indication of the viability and your forward plan. So the next step really is then once you've identified and you've mapped out and you've got your, you know, you really need to move into your product design. Um, you know, that we discussed just now that the actual digital uh, devices have many features, but also the other things to consider then is the regulatory, um, the compliance requirements as touched on by an earlier speaker. You know, the reg how do you manage your registrations? How do you manage the, um, the, the, if the result, if it's a positive, I mean, you know, some infectious disease require um, post, post care, how do you fit into um, the, the networks and also how do you manage, so how do you actually deal with the result once it's been, once it's been created? Also, what kind of liabilities are there in terms of your, um, in terms of your product and also the logistics of, of developing and delivering this to, to your customers and to your customers' customers? Um, how is that paid for? Is it paid on a, on a per click? Is it paid through in, uh, different models in the US, through insurance models? Um, and, and indeed, you know, the customer service aspect is really quite important. 
Also, um, who accesses the data? Do you work off a, of a um, multi-tenant system and platform, or do you actually manage your data? Who sees the information? Does the user see it locally, or does it actually just get transmitted to local local cl um, clinic network or to the hospital? Who accesses the data, and why do they need to see it? And also consider IP in the space as well, um, which is obviously an, an important consideration. So the key takeaway, once you've done that, is information and scoping is really key. Um, play to your own strengths. So if you, if you are considering to develop a, a digital solution, then I certainly play to the strengths and outsource really where and when required. And I think that's a, the that's a key. It doesn't all have to be um, made, made at home. Um, once you've got that in play, then some of the other um, technical challenges you need to think about is the actual solution. Um, you know, do you want your uh, solution to talk to other devices? Um, is there a need for unique patient IDs or barcodes that require? Does the sample ID need to be um, individualized? And also, is there a requirement for sign off at different um, levels of, of, of data sharing? And also, again, payment portals. Um, we've used examples, for instance, where um, this would be embedded into an existing application where you um, purchase your tests. So you can actually buy your tests through the app and then um, you know, you, through the existing um, corporate application and, and, and presence. And then um, you, you actually pay through the, through the app and then to run to, for the test and then to run, your, to run your device. And also what platforms are, we, are, we, are you looking to, whether it's Android and iOS or whether a native developed or hybrid model. So all those things that need to be considered. And again, you know, some of the challenges there then are the, um, the, the really the need for organization-wide planning. Very often you'll find um, a, a business will employ a digital specialist or say, right, okay, we'll bring our, our digital project manager or digital marketing person on board and they'll take a big box. This is, with adopting a digital strategy is a transformational next stage step in a, in a business strategy. And so therefore it needs, it has mul multiple touch points. It really does need to be at, at, at that important in your own strategy. And that because it touches on various different um, functions within your organization as well. Um, also the, um, the fault tolerances in terms of the um, connections and connectivity and other wireless technologies need to be considered. Um, and how, how you deploy that from a technology perspective. So um, uh, in terms of uh, the training requirements, again, you've got a new process, new planning, a new product extension or new product, uh, make sure that the training is in place and then how you train in the field as well um, and train the usage. So these are all kind of key requirements and considerations that, that we took and, and put in place. I mean, the key takeaway here as well is is making sure you have a realistic expectation of the investment, both in time and in uh, uh, investment money, as well as personnel and is really needs to be addressed. And you'll know that through um, a proper scoping of your, of your model. Um, then that will help you decide then about how you engage with your specialists in-house or your transform specialists and suppliers. So just a quick little case study there, just to give you an example of how we, how we pull it out together. Um, AppDX, as I said, is a um, imaging technology based around uh, uh, proprietary knowledge and is patent pending on some of the um, machine learning applications that we've employed. These read lateral flow tests and the lateral flow tests can be deployed against in multi different um, areas, multi different disciplines, but essentially the technology is core and is the same. Um, so using the uh, reader and, and the reader system, we looked at this and because you have multi, multiple different usages in the different markets, whether you're recording samples in a, in a veterinary surgery, whether you're out in the field um, in herd management, or whether you're um, in a, at home doing a, doing a test for um, uh, calprotectin, or whether you're, 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 you're running um, in a doctor's surgery um, on, on, on frontline triage. There's various different use cases when using um, AppDX and, or, or smartphone reader um, with, the, with your test. But what we took on basically was our internal specialism technology was really about the, the scanning and, and, and really about identifying and using the IP around the image. So our core, our imaging technology is very much um, what we do in house. Um, we understand the internal strategy around and the strategy of use with, with lateral flow testing. Um, 
but you know regulatory legal um and user experience um that we had a choice we could either bring on build out in-house or actually partner we chose the partnership route in that area so we work with uh, so we outsource and subcontract a lot of our um data management data hosting and actual user interface and software app design um as so that's effectively what we do um in terms of our model and also with the web portal analytics then and partner with with app developers on the software side because they can bring that um questionnaire and data management aspect to it while we provide that um imaging of the lateral flow test which together develops a very powerful solution then you've got your you've got your Keynesian um, diagnostic with um app application with with look, looking at readings and looking at information provided by patient you've got your actual diagnostic result and that together can be transmitted to the caregiver or the person making a decision on the diagnostic outcome um, and that's effectively our, our experience of this so our, essentially then in summary our key take home learnings is be very clear on the benefit that the strategy will deliver and what the pay the payback is for you and for the customer and what are, what is the ideal scenario speak with your customers and stakeholders and then commit uh, make it a business business wise strategy commitment um this shouldn't be a pet project or shouldn't be um to the side it's a central strategy that can be adopted and and, and all and should be given that importance and credibility in your own organization um certainly embrace outsourcing model um there's a lot of experts in the different fields that when they come together can ultimately provide a very strong solution um and so that certainly should be something that's feared it doesn't all have to be self-built and also be very clear on your time scale and investment both to yourselves and to your customers and to your market and shareholders um and that's effectively what um what our key to our key take homes would be from this and that's me done That's great, Lee. Um, some real nuggets of learning there and uh, take home messages. I, I think particularly the strategy, the importance of having strategy behind something. And of course, third party engagement. You don't have to have all the skills in house, uh, but you know, you can go out to third parties such as, for example, Bryn Sage and Peter Brady that are uh, massively experienced at helping companies uh, in respect to connectivity. OK, so could I ask the speakers now to uh, come off mute and also uh, perhaps to turn the videos on, if that's possible? Uh, and we'll move to the, the question and answer session. Um, first of all, one, one for Lee. Um, we're talking about the use of smartphones and there are lots of phones out there uh, with lots of different uh, resonance in terms of image. Does that in any way impact on using a smartphone for that application? So essentially what you do is you, um, you, you, you've got a minimum recommended quality of, of optics. The optics now in smartphones are really quite advanced, even in the mid range um, and, and lower range um, smartphones. But essentially what you do is you deploy a corrective factor in, 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 your, in your development. So you'll have a core, you'll validate or verify certainly some of the performance on a core model um, and that will give deliver us a family of phones. But then from your scoping, you'll understand the, the, the breadth of how you want this. And then effectively, what you do then is you, you verify the phone families based around the, um, the, the, the specification of the optics used. And you, we do that and you develop a, a corrective factor that can be, um, that can be recognized when you scan. Um, and then that, that's applied then um, at that point. So it's all done in the software. Okay, okay. And a, a, another question for Lee, uh, we're aware that smartphone readers in the past uh, have been peculiar to individual companies. So does your app DX work with other lateral flow tests from other manufacturers? Absolutely. Yes, this um, is completely agnostic to the lateral flow test. OK, super. Thank you. Um, just moving on to uh, Bryn. Could you say a little bit more as to how you go about developing a new app? Um, where to go with a particular piece of hardware? It was interesting. I was speaking to a company in the Northwest not so long ago that was looking at an app uh, for diabetes to, to, to go with a sensor and, and they didn't know where to go. And they had a chance encounter with someone in Warwickshire 
and it was very much a chance encounter. So, so yeah, how does one go about developing an app and who do they go to? Well, I think we cover a lot of it off in great detail, but the first thing is, is you've got to decide what you're trying to achieve and why you're trying to achieve that. And I'll talk in context of how we work with, with organisations, whether it be an NHS organisation or, or a third party manufacturer. First of all, there's two elements to it. When you sit down and create what we call a straw man, what basically the app's going to look like before you start investing huge amounts of money with app developers. And then what we created to make out of experience is we, we created a, a toolkit that in effect allows you to fail fast. So you build out your app in a, in a, in a, in, in, within our toolkit, iron out all the wrinkles, and then you can invest in the actual app development to get the look and feel of what you want. But the other thing to remember as well as a device manufacturer is how are you gonna get your information into a system, into the app if you, if you like. And when we started out with Roche many years ago, uh, it was done by the individual actually reading the meter and keying it into an automated phone call, which then transferred into our platform and into the dosing systems and then back out again uh, as, as, a, as an analog thing. And people forget that, that voice is a channel that people like to use. Uh, and ultimately there'll be, well, there is now and there's voice readers. That's been superseded by Bluetooth, but do you want to get initially into the expense of creating a Bluetooth adapter for your piece of tech? and so on and so forth. So there's various bits you have to ask yourselves in, in terms of how much you want to invest up front. But the approach we take is quick straw man approach and fail fast. And if you fail fast, as I say, it's cost effective. At the toolkit that we've got allows you to do it either yourself or engaging with us on a professional services basis uh, to do that. I mean, some apps can be created overnight because the basic constituent parts are within the platform. So only when you get down to specific algorithms, that it goes deep into a development team for the platform. And then once that's done, then you can invest in app developers who create the look and feel and the brand and the whole user experience as, as it was put in the last presentation. Okay, a, a question for, for Peter, or, or perhaps Peter and, and the others. The, the question of co-development, how important is it to get involved with co-development with a customer base? Uh, and, and how important is it to uh, focus on specific patient pathways? Oh, yeah, I think that that that's, um, has huge benefits. I think co-development with a customer, it, it just increases your uh, confidence that you're capturing all of their requirements and all of their needs. Uh, and I think that goes beyond uh, security, just simply, uh, you know, I think it's good practice these days, um, particularly, um, when it might not be uh, so straightforward to elucidate all the requirements, just, just working with clients makes it make, makes it much uh, a, a more effective process of uh, of capturing needs. And, uh, and and I think as far as security is concerned, then it, it it's something that would just give you more awareness of what the potential vulnerabilities are. And and just. Uh... Peter, in terms of Lee's comment uh, on the importance of strategy, any views on that? Yeah, yeah, I think it's with all things, isn't it? I think having a, a clear strategy and a plan and um, you know, for, for all sorts of things, regulatory compliance and a, a, a plan for, um, uh, a plan for uh, uh, information security. And, and that's where the standard ISO 27001 talks about that it is a risk-based approach to implementing information security through a plan do check act um, process okay yeah, absolutely so i have a, a question here that's beyond me i must admit is uh, https considered to be a good data transfer mechanism from medical device to cloud so is the https considered to be a good transfer mechanism from the medical device to the cloud? Yeah, uh, well, it, it is a good data transfer mechanism and it's used in banking and, um, you know, online banking and, uh, and uh, e-commerce solutions. So it's good. The question is, uh, is it good enough? Um, and, uh, and, and that's the whole point about risk management 
and the approach that's taken in, in ISO 27001 is to understand essentially what the value of the information asset is and what are the consequences of it being um, corrupted in some way in terms of both confidentiality, integrity and availability. Uh, and then to consider what the weaknesses are of that protocol. Um, and there are weaknesses and whether or not the, the, the risk outweighs the, the benefit. And that tells you whether or not you need to do something more than use HTTPS or, or whether it's good enough. So, so, so I think the, the, the short answer is that yes, it is a good mechanism, but it's not necessarily, you don't know whether it's good enough until you actually consider the risks, the threats and the consequences. Okay, any other response to that? Is that, that's pretty definitive. Thank, th thanks for that, Peter. Uh, any more questions from anybody in the audience? Um, our speakers have been very succinct in their presentation, so I thank you for that. Um, I've not had to police timing. Uh, let's see if we've got another There's question. Some questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, I, picked, I think I've picked some of those up. Um, how long to make a robust imager that can handle all the errors that users make positioning the test in the image rather than just proof of a concept? So how long to make a robust imager that can handle all the errors that users make positioning the test in the image rather than just proof of concept? Does that, is that clear to perhaps Lee? Yeah, I guess exactly it's in your stuff. device. Yeah, um, the, the, the initial, uh, the actual, um, you put wireframe, um, you put wireframe imaging on the test to make sure the tests are uh, um, set up properly. Um, the question again, what is it? Is it, how long does it take to? Oh, there we go. I've, uh, this clever technology allows me to dismiss it once it's been answered and then I bring it back it again. Yeah, then I just so brought it back again. How yeah, long to I, make a robust imager? So how long will it take yeah. to make a robust imager that can handle all the errors that users make positioning the test in the image rather than just a proof of concept? It's, it's the length of time. About, you're looking at about 60, 60 days to get through to in order to set up the basic um, imaging algorithm. From that point on, then it's all about um, repeat testing to drive to drive um, error down and, ac and accuracy and improve your accuracy. And then you will finally get that to plateau off. So you're looking at around about a three to four month process. OK, I've got a, a question here um, for Peter. Do you have to hire someone to try and hack your device? to know if it's going to be safe or not. How do you no. certify that you've addressed all the risks? There you go, that refers to your little example. Yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't have to hire a, an external party. It helps, there are lots of businesses that will do um, penetration testing and they, they'll you know, stress test your organization, they'll send fish, phishing emails to your employees um uh to see whether or not they can get into your your technology so there are lots of third parties that will do um external penetration testing but you don't have to you don't have to do that I think do we were yourself. experiencing quite a number of nhs organizations that are insistent on you having a cyber essentials type certification which i guess is is an extension of that isn't it paying someone to hack your systems Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the gold standard is to have ISO 27001 certification, um, which shows that you have an information security management system in place, that you've considered all of the risks and the threats, and you've put appropriate protective measures in, in place, some of which are IT based, some of which are physical um, access control um, to your to your site. Um, and, and personnel issues, which is why it overlaps with uh, quality management systems. So if you're uh, in the general commercial world, ISO 9001 um, would overlap in some respects with uh, 27001. Um, and in medical devices, then it's, it's ISO 13.5 that overlaps with 27001. And so that's the, the gold standard to, to show that you, you're taking information security seriously. And I think as a, from a commercial perspective, more and more clients, whether that's organizations like the NHS or other healthcare providers 
will start demanding it. Okay, one specific question for Lee. Can the app take a reading which is not a positive or a negative that gives a reading as a result? Um, yeah, so um, you've got to look at the test system together. Um, so effectively, if the test itself has got a good dose response, um, which is quite steep, and you've got good separation from the data points and the test results, then then yes, I mean, you've got, um, you can really get a value reading instead of having a, a positive or negative and move more into a semi-quantitative or quantitative um, result. Okay, that's super. Any more for any more? Any questions from the audience? Any comments from the speakers? Okay, if not, that concludes our session. It concludes our Q&A. Thanks very much to uh, Lee, Bryn and Peter. Really appreciate taking the time to prepare the, the presentations and to join us. Uh, just to say that our next webinar will be at 3.30 this afternoon uh, and you'll be able to access through the same link uh, as you did for this one. And the webinar will cover regulation, uh, a subject that's uh, close to all our hearts. Um, I, I think to me, this entire webinar series uh, is about how do we overcome some of those challenges. And I've lost touch with the amount of companies that the second you mention security information governance, they say, well, we're not going there. It's beyond our means. But I think it's really important to understand that there are third parties out there that can help them get from A to C. They don't have to have it in house and it's not um, an insurmountable challenge. And, and my experience with so many companies is they, they just back off because they, they hear that the challenges are, are far too great. Uh, and clearly, I, I wasn't too sure, Lee, whether two years ago or three years ago, uh, you guys were looking at, at, at digitizing your medical device through, through the reader. But as and when you did, you clearly took advantage of, of third parties to make it happen. Absolutely. Okay, so I'll see you hopefully at 3.30 and thank you everyone again. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to those who have joined this webinar series for the first time, and welcome back to those who have participated in the two earlier webinars. This is the second session focusing on specific challenge areas, with our earlier session looking at security and information governance. This webinar will focus on regulation. I, I think I've lost count of the people who have said to me that life is difficult enough with MDR and the new regulations associated with Brexit without having to consider different regulations associated with medical device digitization. However, what is clear from our previous webinars is that there is an increasing demand in the NHS and in healthcare delivery organizations across the world for connected devices and that an increasing number of these devices are being successfully placed onto the market. So clearly regulation isn't an insurmountable problem. The first thing I'd like to do is to thank our three speakers in advance for taking the time to pull together their presentations uh, and to be with us today. Uh, after their presentations, we will have a, a question and answer session. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question, then please do through the QA function on your screen. And I will do my best to present these to the speakers at the end of the presentations. One final point, this session will be recorded and you will have access to this recording afterwards. So uh, with that, let's make a start. Uh, to this final webinar of today. We're delighted to have with us Adrian Stavart Dobson, the Managing Director of SafeAm Consulting. And the title of Adrian's presentation is Specific Considerations for Digital Connectivity. So Adrian, if you could un unmute and share your screen, I will hand over to you now. Great, thanks for that, Kevin. Can I just check before we go any further? Everyone can see my slides okay? That's looking good. Perfect. Lovely. Uh, well, thanks for that, Kevin. Yeah, uh, so I'm Adrian Stavart-Dobson. Uh, I'm the CEO of Safe Ant Consulting. 
We're a small consultancy company and we specialize in uh, compliance around digital health products. Uh, in terms of me, I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor by background, but I've spent the last 20 years or so working full time in health IT. So this session, I'm going to be talking very briefly about some of the regulations and standards which apply the moment you start connecting various bits of, of technology together, usually using software. Now, I'm, I'm quite aware that the moment, when you, the moment you mention regulations and standards, often people's eyes glaze over and they stare into the distance. So uh, I will try and uh, avoid some of the more uh, uh, gruelling aspects of this and leave it at a, a sort of a high level introduction, really. So the first thing to think about is that when you're trying to work out which standards and regulations apply, it's worth thinking about the various different architectures that you can see the moment you start to connect uh, a medical technology together. I've, I've broadly categorized it into these five areas here. So the first area I'm actually not going to say a great deal about, but this relates to medical devices that have got embedded software. So that's quite a traditional model. People have been working with that for some time. So this is where you might have a software component within maybe a, a syringe driver or a cardiac pacemaker or something like that. These systems tend to be relatively standalone, so I'm not going to say too much about that. So, but the second category is more common, and this is where you have some kind of traditional tangible medical device, but it has some kind of connected so, uh, separate software component, in this case, which itself is a medical device. So to give you some idea of an example, for it, it could be perhaps a sensor that has been uh, applied to the patient. Some data is taken from that, and then that's passed to some other completely separate software component to do a degree of, of, of analysis and processing and responding. The third category are, is similar, so that's where we have a medical device, but the software component of it is for some reason a non-medical device. It doesn't meet the medical device criteria. So a good example in this case might be perhaps uh, maybe a vital signs monitor where we're, we're taking data from that and perhaps storing it on a remote database somewhere for future uh, archive and retrieval purposes, but without processing it in any way. Category four is software as a medical device. So this is where we have a pure software, an intangible product that is usually running on some kind of traditional hardware, be it a phone or a desktop or on a cloud service. And then finally, we have health IT systems. These are kind of um, uh, digital health products that aren't medical devices in, in any way. And this is actually the majority of health technology. Uh, so if you go and see your GP, you'll see him using a computer. Or if you go into hospital, you'll see doctors and nurses recording uh, uh, clinical notes and so on and most of the time these aren't medical devices. Now the relevant standards and regulations vary depending on which class of the architecture you fall into. So let's just look at that. So the first thing to say is that there are really three key areas when it comes to regulation and standards. We have the medical device directive and regulation, we have information governance and security, and DCB 129 and 160. Now I'm deliberately not going to say much about the middle of those three because I know there have been other sessions on that on those. So I'm going to talk mainly about the first and the third. So let's start with the, the big daddy of these, the medical device directive and regulation. Uh, so um, what I've done here is shown a little table and each one of these is one of those categories that I talked about earlier. And as you can see, some of them are, are relevant to medical devices and some aren't. Sort of almost by definition, really, because if you have, a, for example, a, a separate non-medical device component, then obviously it doesn't need to comply with medical device regulation. So think about the special considerations for software as a medical device. It, it's impossible to kind of get any further without mentioning MDR and Rule 11. So I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this, but, but just to, to reiterate, under MDD, the vast majority of, of connected software products have generally inhabited the class one zone. And that, that has meant that people have been able to enjoy all the benefits of self-certification and so on. Unfortunately, come NDR, all, all of that changes because with the introduction of Rule 11, the vast majority of software will now be reclassified as at least a class 2A or above medical device. And that has radical implications, particularly for traditional software manufacturers where it's a step changing what they're obliged to do. And I'll say a little more about that shortly. 
again, it's impossible really to, to give one of these presentations without nodding to the, the idea of what is and isn't a medical device when it comes to software, uh, because that, that is often something that's very difficult for, for a sort of an intangible product. Well, the basic message here is that the definition of a medical device for software is exactly say it the same as the definition of a medical device for, for something that is tangible and traditional. There are a number of guidance documents out there that allow us to interpret that definition in the context of medical devices. And there's actually a great document produced by the MHRA, which a quick Google will, will find you. Uh, and it walks you through some of the key implications uh, from the, from uh, in terms of regulation for, for software medical devices devices. So rather than going through all that definition, I've just set out here some, some common examples of software medical devices. And I think really these are the most common things that people come to us with as an organisation, certainly in the last sort of six to 12 months. So the kinds of things we see are software that does decision making or complex calculations or algorithms and scoring systems and so on. Symptom checkers are those devices where you tell it what your symptoms are and it tells you what it thinks might be wrong with you. Um, where we're processing measurements or perhaps where we're monitoring patients remotely. So perhaps a patient at home monitoring their health with some kind of remote observation. And also software where for whatever reason we're replacing an integrated display in a product with a software product again which is which is quite a common use case so these are just examples of kinds of things but what they have in common is the fact that you're creating new information we're not just storing information and retrieving it we're in some way doing something clever or processing obviously anything that involves ai or those kinds of rules will fall into this category now, of course, you know, in complying with medical device regulation and directive, there are a number of harmonized standards that we're obliged to comply with. I've just put on the screen here a selection of those uh, of those harmonized standards, which uh, include software. Some of these you're probably all, already familiar with, uh, like 62304 and 62366, but there may be some others such as 80001 that you're, you're less familiar with. I am not going to walk you through these standards. I'm sure if I did, you'd, you'd be ready to shoot yourselves in five minutes. But please note them down, go away and Google them afterwards, and you'll get a bit of an idea of some of the things that you will need to be doing as part of your compliance activities. So what are the challenges here? After all, that's what this series of, of discussions is about. Well, I think probably the greatest area of discussion is, is this idea that an awful lot of software as a medical device sits in this grey area of is it or isn't it a medical device? And it can literally be, you know, one field on one screen can actually change that regulatory classification. Uh, for every, I think for every uh, product that you can say it's definitely a medical device or definitely not, there's probably another dozen devices that live in this grey area. And this is really where you benefit from some help from, uh, from someone outside who's, who's perhaps quite close to this. Without going backwards and forwards to the MHRA every five minutes, it's very difficult to get a, a, a precise answer on whether things are medical devices or not. So it is good to involve experts at that point. Probably the biggest issue at the moment, given this move to MDR and Rule 11 and Class 2A, is that the vast majority of traditional software companies are simply not used to this level of regulation. So for those of you who work in traditional medical device companies, things like 13485 will be absolute second nature to you. You'll be used to creating lots of documentations to support your products. In the software industry, there's been this huge move over the last 10 years to move to what is loosely called an agile way of working. The way that's interpreted often wrongly is that things are document light or in some cases um, sort of document absent, unfortunately. It's very, very common now for software companies where the, the only documentation they'll have is maybe a few um, line items, a few requirements in a tool like JIRA and maybe a test report. And that's possibly it. Now, obviously, when those uh, kinds of companies, if they do need to go to a class 2A and, and, and a quality management system, that is a complete cultural uh, shift for them and can be um, quite ugly at times and, and often something that they're un unwilling uh, to do. So if you are in a situation as a medical device supplier where perhaps you're working with a traditional software company, that is very much something to bear in mind. Where organisations do do technical files, they're notoriously very poor. They're often, you know, we, we've seen technical files a couple of sides of A4, just completely pointless uh, and, and indeed unlawful.
It can also be very difficult to work out where the boundaries of software products start and end. So many, most software systems are actually made up of lots of different components. And you may find that some of those fall into medical devices and some of them don't. And it can be quite difficult to draw a boundary some, sometimes be, between those different components. So that's often an area of a lot of debate and discussion. Software components, uh, rarely these days are they created from the ground up. They're usually a mishmash of other components that have been obtained from elsewhere. And this is where we get into this idea of third party components and, and soup, uh, so uh, software of unknown provenance. That in itself can introduce its own challenges, particularly if you're working with suppliers who are from different countries who probably haven't done any form of regulation, and yet you're incorporating those components into your product. And finally, because there is so much discussion around the movement to, uh, to MDR, its relationship with COVID, with Courage and 2 and Brexit, all means that quite frankly, particularly in the UK, we don't know whether precisely Rubble 11 is even going to apply and what the implications of that might be. So a lot of it is still unknown. So let's very briefly mention something about information governance and security. I know you've had other sessions on this, but just as a sort of 30 second view, all of the different classes of, of architecture will all require some form of information governance and security. And it, that's even systems that don't have personally identifiable information within them. So remember, it's still quite possible for uh, uh, an unscrupulous individual to hack into a system and even change the underlying source code even for a system that doesn't have personally identifiable information. So of course they still have to be secure if you haven't got that data in there. This is really just a slide to point out that there are so many different frameworks in this area, which I'm sure you, you, you've talked about in other sessions. The only one I'm going to point out really is the bottom one, DSP Toolkit, which frequently blindsides medical device manufacturers. So the DSP Toolkit is specific to the UK, and it's an online assessment tool that you're required to complete if you have a digital health product and you're selling into the NHS. It is mandatory. You'll find that very few people will even speak to you as a supplier unless you've actually completed this questionnaire and anyone can go in there and actually check to see whether a supplier has made a submission you can't see the details of it but you can see essentially the score at the end of it and where they are with that so this is something that you do have to take seriously perhaps something you might not have come across uh, uh, traditionally so I'm going to talk a little more about now about DCB 129 and 160. Again, these might be standards that perhaps you're less familiar with. So hence me perhaps bringing out a, a, a little bit on this call. So these two standards are not produced by the EU or, any, or, or the MHRA, they're produced by NHS Digital and compliance with them is mandatory if you're selling into the NHS in England and Wales. Now outside of the UK, no one has ever even heard of these standards. So if you're dealing with Euro, exclusively with, with Europe and the US, no one will have heard of these. But if you're selling into the UK, they are mandatory. Uh, they're not enforced in Scotland and Northern Ireland, strangely. Um, they have got nothing whatsoever to do with security and information governance. That's a common misconception. People will say to us, oh, we've already done DSP toolkit 27,001, so we don't need to do this. Um, 129 and 160 is all about safety rather than security. And in the UK, those two things are in separate buckets and they have separate standards associated with them. So 129 and 160 is similar, but not identical to ISO 14971. So ISO 14971, medical device standard uh, uh, for risk management and safety, I'm sure will be something most of you are familiar with. DCB 129 is a subtle variation on that. One of the big differences being that when you actually create the materials, you have to pass them on to your customer in a way that you don't typically do for medical devices. In terms of the applicability of these two standards, they apply to any health IT system or any software uh, that, that is used as a health technology. Now, prior to 2018, if you were a medical device, you didn't need to comply with 129 and 160, but a change was made to those rules in 2018, which now means that you do have to do this. You don't have to do it as part of your medical device compliance. So you'll find that probably that, that you know, they're notified by bodies have never even heard of this stuff, uh, but you will need to do it. You generally completely separately to, and in parallel uh, with your medical device work. 
So why are there two standards? Well, it's very unusual in that there are two standards. 129 applies to the manufacturer of the product, while 160 applies to the healthcare organization. So typically that is normally your customer. So essentially what you're doing is you're doing the risk assessment twice. You do it once under 129, you produce your documentation, you give that to your customer, let's say it's a trust, and then they will repeat the risk assessment for their implementation of your product, and they'll produce a set of documents as well. Now, it's virtually impossible for your customers to do 160 if you haven't done 129. So you'll be making life very, very difficult for them if you don't comply with that standard. Unusually, the work has to be done by someone called a clinical safety officer. Now, that's an individual who is a clinician and who has been specially trained in doing this kind of work. Now, many organisations will outsource that role to somewhere else. As you can imagine, trying to find a clinician who is fluent in health IT systems and also understands safety engineering, they're a very rare breed. And as an organisation, this is the mainstay of what we do. So we provide uh, currently about 55 companies in the UK with a clinical safety officer to do this work. Why are we doing this work? Well, digitally connected systems are notoriously complex. They are often far more complex than traditional medical devices. It's very difficult to see what software is doing and to prove that it's working correctly. So the, uh, the, the standards require a detailed risk management, uh, uh, even, even in the event that it's not a medical device, as we've discussed. I just thought I'd give you some examples here of, of some, uh, some things that we've seen uh, happen in, in the last two or three months where systems have gone wrong and unfortunately co caused issues. So just at, at a high level, obviously, I I'll, 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 uh, won't say who the culprits are to, uh, to protect the innocent or, or, or guilty, as you may see them. Um, so one, one example system here is a system that collects data from lots of other systems in the trust. So it will show you a patient and then all the different bits of information for that patient. And in this particular case, it was all correct. It was all fine. All the, the diagnoses and appointments and lab results, everything were all there. But where it showed you the patient's current medications, it showed you medications for a completely different patient without indicating it was for a different patient because it was completely believable, but ultimately wrong. And obviously that, that could potentially lead to a very serious incident. We do often see workflow issues. So one example here, uh, a system where you can upload scans into the system and then a clinician can review them and report on them. Uh, and in this case, the scans were being, uh, were being put into the system, but disappearing into a black hole. So the clinicians were not seeing that the, the, the scans were, were available to be reviewed and therefore a, a, a long delay uh, potentially in diagnosis. Uh, and also terminology mismatch often results in um, very quite unusual and bizarre uh, scenarios. So you'll often find that uh, health technology contains a kind of dictionary of terms. And some of you will, will come across these things uh, so, such as SNOMED and these other ontologies. And it's very common for one system to be using one form of terminology and another system to be using some other form. And uh, an example here recently is we found that um, patients who were suffering from diabetes, when their diagnoses were viewed on this particular system, it changed the word diagnoses into simply sardines, which you know you, you couldn't make up, but they just happened to be another term out there with a very similar code uh, that unfortunately got translated into. So these are the kinds of things that can happen. None of these are medical devices, I would say. Uh, and this is why risk management is important to try and make sure that these things don't happen. So when you comply with the standard, you're obliged to create three documents, the clinical risk management plan, the hazard log and the clinical safety case report. These are uh, these deliverables are different, particularly the first and last ones uh, to the ones that you will see in 14971. And as we say, these documents will be need to be shared with your customers. The clinical safety officer also has to keep this documentation up to date in live service of the product. So you can't just write them once, just as with medical devices, everything has to be kept up to date in line with the product. 
In terms of how these two particular standards are enforced, again, it's not through the MHRA, it's not through EU law. Instead, it's generally done through pressure from NHS Digital, but also through things like commercial contracts and procurement frameworks. So if you respond to a tender, for example, from a trust, you will often see things like DCB 129 in there as a mandatory requirement. Also, if you try to sell into the NHS using some of the procurement frameworks, which are becoming increasingly popular, then to get onto those frameworks, works, you will nearly always need to demonstrate compliance with 129. Similarly, um, if you connect to national systems or you try and get access to the app libraries, uh, so for example, if you try to connect to um, the Spine PDS service uh, or ERS or some of those others, again, uh, you, NHS Digital won't speak to you unless you can show that you've complied with DCB 129. So in, in summary, there are a number of different standards and regulations in this area which apply to digital solutions and particularly when you start to connect different medical devices together. The regulations that apply depend on the precise architecture and, and co of those components and which bits are medical devices, which bits aren't and how they all interact with each other. If you don't comply with them, then that can result in uh, failing to be able to access certain markets or, of course, in some cases, in the worst case, actually committing a criminal offence. And I suppose the takeaway message is that uh, all of this stuff isn't always straightforward and getting help and guidance from those who, who do this on a more regular basis and who have gone before you uh, is perhaps uh, rather helpful. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll look forward to receiving uh, questions uh, at the end of the session. Those are my contact details and don't hesitate to get in touch. Thanks a lot, Kevin. OK, uh, yeah, just a reminder to the audience, if you do have any questions whilst Adrian's talk is fresh in your mind, uh, please use the QA function uh, on the system. OK, so that's great and a clear message that it is a complex area uh, and that you need to seek advice from people that do this sort of thing on a on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm pleased now to to invite our, our next speaker, uh, Cliff Kirby, who is the CEO of NeedleSmart, and he'll be doing a presentation on the next generation of vaccine delivery systems, which, as you can imagine, is extremely topical at the moment. So Cliff, if I could ask you to unmute and to share your screen with the presentation, that would be great. Hi Kevin, how are you doing? Hi guys. I will just go through the technology barrier and start the presentation. Okay, so um, first of all, thanks everyone for tuning in and listening in. Um, my name's Cliff Kirby, I'm the Chief Exec and Founder of Needle Smart Limited. Um, as a business, I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about our digital vaccination system and how we believe we help with managing what is going to be the largest vaccination campaign in history. First of all, may I ask uh, or may I say a little about the company? Needle Smart's not a new business. Um, in fact, we launched our first full product to the marketplace in November of 2019 at Medica, and we then early 2020 started distributing our non-smart technology which focused on needle disposal and uh, we started shipping that to around 10 countries around the world and we've backed that up with a, a smaller more portable handheld version for use with insulin patients and um, of course as we hit march of this year we're all faced with lockdown and we hit a pause button on our standard and conventional business models Sorry, sorry, Cliff. Uh, we're not seeing your your presentation. Oh, we but my, my apologies. Check. It's working this side, Kevin. Let me start again. Okay, I'll uh, I'll give you the nod when I can see it. Yeah, bear with. Okay, let me try this. Yeah, full How's screen. That looking? That's brilliant. Thanks, Cliff. Yeah, apologies. They moved me onto a new laptop and it's um, I'm blaming IT. I can never blame myself for that. Um, OK, so uh, I, I've, I've danced through a little of the business. I, I won't I won't repeat that. Um, as we move now a little bit about our business, 
the technology of Needle Smart was originally developed by myself all the way back in 2008. But the, the heart of the technology, the, the, uh, the mechanism that destroys the hypodermic needle effectively is still largely the same process that was patented back then. And we've backed that up with a significant patent portfolio since. And I think what this slide really does is illustrate the journey that the business has been on up to and including where we are today, where we find ourselves uh, right in the middle of what is to become a very exciting and very busy 2021 for Needle Smart DVS. So I'll talk to you a little more now about our actual system. So DVS, Digital Vaccination System, what is it? What does it mean? And why is it different? And why do we believe it will help? Well, first and foremost, at the heart of the technology is our standard Needle Smart Pro unit. That product has been designed, um, it's been developed, and it's production ready and capable and in use around the world to destroy a, a standard range of needles which are used extensively in all parts of the world. That product forms the cornerstone of DVS. Effectively, what happens is that this links with our technology, our software platform, to create a moment in time which destroys the hypodermic needle and creates a compliance event. So what do we believe we're doing? Idea, what is our brief? So we identify what we think are the four crit critical aspects that need to be known about in this current regime and what's going to be the uh, 2021, the year of mass vaccination. First and foremost, who administered the vaccine? Secondly, who was vaccinated, the individual? Thirdly, what vaccination did they receive? Of course, right now, all we talk about is COVID-19, but for those of us who believe health passporting will find its way into our future, that won't just be COVID-19, it will be uh, a full spectrum of various travel-related vaccinations. And fourthly, when and where were they vaccinated? And DVS allows you to capture all of this information in an intuitive, safety-driven manner, which has a significant process improvement. How does it work? So a little bit about our technology before we talk more about DVS in its operation. Um, we take a standard needle and syringe combination. We have a range that we will work with. We will heat them to 1300 degrees. The actual process takes around half a second, but the actual device will not allow the removal of the needle for around five seconds. It's physically locked while the, while the what was a molten needle is, is cooled to be uh, room temperature and, and able to be touched. Although we're not advising you should do that, many people tend to see that the actual process has worked. Um, the, the system itself creates no waste. So what you can see on the screen in front of you is what was a needle. There is no secondary waste stream and that can then be pushed onto further downstream disposal, be that via sharp spins, clinical waste bags or, or other means identified across the world. To support that, we have a strong intellectual property portfolio of five patents in the family, covering everything from the base level of how you dispose of a needle to, to what is our latest piece of IP, which is how do you transmit the data record at the same time as disposing of the needle. So the digital vaccination system that we've developed, what is it predicated on? We've built the system largely around how do we offer maximum benefit in the vaccination area. And we see two levels to this. We see what it can do to make the patient's journey quicker and simpler and easier, and what it can do to make the vaccinator, be that the nurse or the doctor, make their life easier and make their work environment safer. In the process of doing that, we create a mechanism that allows the data to be transmitted as the needle is disposed of in our Needle Smart Pro unit, and it pushes that record to a given location. That might be a centralized secure cloud, or indeed it might be direct to a health records provider. On the other side of that, we can automatically um, produce a just-in-time supply chain so that as we move into the realms of large-scale vaccination with multiple thousands happening on a daily basis, there is a way to push and pull the consumable demands through the Needle Smart system. Um, so we have a process, we define it in four steps. It's simple, it's secure, it's swift, and it's safe. If I then just walk through the process a little more as to how we've achieved this and, and where do we see the value and the savings. So walking through the process, first of all, we are a cloud-based technology 
which can link directly to any number of platforms. We are platform agnostic and we're not trying to push forward a replacement to any health record systems, quite the opposite, trying to work in harmony with them. Um, we have a, a cloud-based solution that will send a link directly to a, a patient or to a, a facility that's going to carry out vaccination. They will forward send that link to the patient and somebody will take ownership of completing that information. That can be done on a smartphone, it can be done on a laptop, or indeed it can be done remotely and, and a printout uh, taken to the vaccination area. What we're doing is we're asking people not for their health record, we're asking them for who are they. So their name, address, date of birth, and perhaps a reference number. So UK markets might be an NHS number, international markets might be an insurance number. They then, in the process, carry out a vaccination checklist. So they, they fulfill the obligation to say whether they can or can't have a vaccine and whether or not they have allergies that the vaccinator needs to be aware of. And on the assumption that they, they pass their way through the vaccination checklist, they are offered the opportunity to book a time and date to uh, arrive at a clinic for a vaccination. So let's walk into the vaccination room now. They, the patient has arrived. They present their QR code, which has been delivered to them via the onboarding process. That is then scanned by the needle smart side of the system. So the healthcare professional side of the system. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, and that, assuming is the right person, will bring the person into the room. So we've now onboarded the individual into the process. At the same time as that, using a scan tool, that can be through the camera or it can be through a scan gun separately, we will scan the vaccine. So we'll scan the manufacturer, the type of vaccine, the batch number and the expiry date will be the information we gather. So we brought both of those pieces of information centrally and then the vaccination is carried out by the professional. It's carried out in the, in the way it would always be carried out. And then at the point of disposing of the needle, the data transmits. So we've not added another step. We've not brought um, another process in, in terms of administration. Actually, what we've done is removed a huge amount of that burden while creating a, a safe environment for the healthcare professional. It's important to note that once the needle has been destroyed with needle smarts technology, it is no longer a sharp by definition. It's, it's safe, it's sterile, it's, vac uh, excuse me, it's virus and bacteria free and it's also capable of offering some significant downstream savings to the Sharps disposal system while creating a, a removal of the post-procedural needle stick risk to the end user. So what have we done really in, in terms of the, the process? Well, NeedleSmart as a system has a, a complete end-to-end -end mass, vac mass vaccination solution. So what you're really seeing is that from the point of uh, vaccination in the in the suite where the, the actual vaccination takes place right the way through to the corporate head office of whether this is private or public sector there is a full suite of product and service layers to allow the vaccination campaign to happen efficiently and um, we believe that uh, through conversations we've had with quite a large number of people who are already engaged in other types of vaccination that a minimum of 50 percent of a vaccination appointment is spent on the actual administration, whether that's writing up the notes or onboarding the patient to the vaccination. We believe the DVS process has eliminated a large percentage of that, although it's important to note that we, we do offer the manual override facility for those events that inevitably will happen where somebody forgets to register properly or indeed forgets to bring their QR code to the appointment. Another USP for us is that every time we dispose of the needle, we create a unique digital signature. That unique digital signature is, is individual, it's incredibly difficult to try and replicate, and it is only known to the system itself or to the admin level of whoever is operating the DVS suite at that point in time. We think it's important to have something like this available uh, in a, what will be ultimately become a commodity-driven marketplace and allow, um, allow the end users to be able to track real time and, and with credibility, the true record of who has been vaccinated. Again, that is of a view that health passporting will become some part of our future. Um, one of the things that I think it's important to bring out at this point is that 
by creating that secure record and it's a data agnostic record it's not it's not linked to any given data transcript and um, we are effectively centralizing a record which can which means that not only are we offering an efficiency but we're offering a way to gather uh, incredibly valuable data in a in an agnostic fashion in in as efficient a way as possible as close to the point as vaccination as we believe is possible and um, i think a couple of other points that we could note on that point is the uh, as we carry this through, we are automating the resupply of the consumables. This could include the vaccination itself, if that was deemed necessary. And of course, the ability to log and control the, um, the vaccination disposal or destruction means that you can create a payment by results mechanism. So let's try and summarize a little more of what we've done. Um, Needle Smart has, we call it clinical speed and compliance, and we've increased that. We believe we've increased that by around about 50%. And um, the unique compliance record that we've linked directly to the back of the record cannot be replicated and, and is known to a very select group of individuals. And um, we've captured the four big questions, the who, the when, the where, and the why, and that happens in a process that is in theory, 50% faster than a standard process today while removing significant chunks of the uh, fatigue that will undoubtedly be seen in the vaccination environment. We look at the data specifically, what we have gathered at the point of vaccination is a compliance record. What Needle Smart DVS does is it transacts between the physical and the virtual. So we take the disposal of the needle as the compliance moment the moment whereby there is a time and date stamp placed against the vaccine record. Now, we think that it's, it's difficult to get it any closer to the point of vaccination than to the moment where you dispose of the sharps waste. Of course, that, that brings forward the principle that this data is effectively virgin data. It's um, file agnostic, as I've mentioned, and as such could be pushed forward to whoever becomes the incumbent provider of a digital health record or health passport. Um, the resupply element, I think, should not be ignored. It's certainly something that internationally is receiving a huge amount of interest from the distribution partners we're working with now. And finally, as we look inside the room itself, the vaccination room, we are offering a situation or a solution that is, that is genuinely adding value to the healthcare professional's workflow. We are offering a solution that allows the sharps risk to be eliminated post procedure and at the same time as that uh, transmitting the data and removing the admin burden so the needle stick injury has been removed from the environment at the point of disposal as has the data it has physically left needle smart as an entity at that point i'm keen to point out that we're not the data owner we are the processor of this we are a facilitator rather than trying to gather the individual data and own it we are trying to push this forward to whoever should own this in the future I would then also add that by function of disposing of a needle and creating a sharp safe sphere, we have in essence reduced the sharp spin capacity by a, a minimum of 50%. And um, I can share that internationally, there are different countries and different territories treating how they dispose of this in a different way, which removes the sharp spin entirely. But of course, as a business, we are not in a position to advise on that. We really can only state what we, we know in front of us, which is that if you destroy uh, a thousand needles with a needle smart device and you place that same thousand needles in a sharp spin that aren't destroyed with a needle smart device you will see a 50 percent capacity improvement as a minimum so i'd like to end my presentation in there and i will invite any questions via the q a link That's super. Thanks, Cliff. Um, a great case study of how you've taken a physical uh, needle disposal device uh, and you've actually looked at a different need. You've linked to a software platform uh, to provide maximum benefits, both for the patients and also the clinic in a, in a different area or, or building on the, the market they already have, but certainly looking at the maximum benefit uh, in that different space. So that's super. That's a, a, a great case study. Um, certainly, Cliff mentioned that, that the, he pushed uh, the, the stuff to the cloud. And I understand that our next speaker, Jane Aldridge, 
the director of L2S2 uh, is going to give us a presentation now on the managed medical device cloud. So if I could ask you to unmute, uh, unmute Jane uh, and also share your presentation, that would be great. Super. Um, no, with pleasure. I hope everyone can hear me properly. Um, first of all, what great presentations from Adrian and from Cliff. Um, I really enjoyed your covering of the of the compliance landscape, Adrian. I thought that was great. And and Cliff, um, what a fantastic story you have. It's really great. I really enjoyed that. And I just hope that you're able to get your devices into use in the um, over the next months, because uh, there's so much need for them. It could bring so be, be so useful with the fight against COVID. Right, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, let me just go back for a second and share my screen. Here we go. Right, I hope everyone can see my screen now and let's start the presentation. Right. That's that's super. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, right. So L2S2, um, I thought I'd start off by telling you a little bit about us. We um, started L2S2 in 2007. Um, we started off with a, a very strong engineering background. We've won, the, the team has won um, awards for um, instrumentation, national instrumentation awards over the years. We've got a background, a strong background in producing good laboratory practice um, compliant software for the pharmaceutical industry. And we set off, started working in, in healthcare doing software consultancy. Um, the team, Phil Gaffney um, has an OB for services to science and technology. Um, he is very much a, 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 an engineer's engineer with a, a very broad and deep knowledge of, of engineering and of medical device design. In fact, he lectures to final year engineering students in the University of Cambridge on medical device design. Um, I've worked with him for years um, on the commercial side of the businesses we've set up together. Tom is um, very qualified. He's an emergency medicine physician. Not just that, he's also a data um, specialist. He has spearheaded the introduction into the UK of the new emergency care data set, which is a very high quality data set that he's brought in and introduced to all 200 odd trusts throughout the country. Um, and it's been delivered and made working with, I think about 40 different um, EPR systems. Um, he's also an AI expert. On top of that, he's a qualified clinical safety officer. So he, he also performs that role for us, but he is our medical director. And we are focused on trying to resolve issues in healthcare and particularly around um, compliance and removing the compliance barrier. Um, these are some of our partners. Um, we've partnered with ARM. We are working with them to help them move the next generation of devices into healthcare. And we also have partnered with NHS Digital, for example, we hold, we're authorized by them to hold and process over a hundred million um, healthcare records, which we do for among other people, CQC. And we've worked with a wide variety of different organizations through the years. The background to really where we, we sit is that um, obviously telehealth, digital healthcare is massive, it's growing rapidly. There is a massive drive towards telehealthcare and a lot of organizations, a lot of countries within Europe and North America um, and elsewhere are changing laws, they're changing payment mechanisms to enable the introduction of telehealth and, um, and to make it possible for their countries to reap the benefits that it can bring. Um, and obviously there are you know, very good reasons why, um, why we'd want to do that, let alone COVID. But there are very real barriers that hinder and delay innovation. Um, the first is that when you have to apply compliance, not just compliance to information governance standards, but to medical device regulation, obviously, you change the type of development 
formats that you have to implement. It's slow, it makes it more costly because it's regulated. Data governance is very regulated as well. And uh, again, these are hurdles that everyone has to overcome if you want to enter this market. And then, of course, a lot of healthcare systems are actually fortressed and hard to get into. And if you rely for the success of your project on being able to get data in and out of healthcare EPR systems, it's yet another problem that you have to overcome. So we've tried to develop a solution to this particular problem, or to the set of problems. And what we have developed is MMDC. Um, managed Medical Device Cloud is not, but it goes much more than just data hosting and um, data management, which we do. It actually also incorporates a suite of software that enables really rapid deployment of new ideas and innovation. So it links patients in the community, the, 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 the hosting links patients in the community with their devices and, and community care, um, healthcare personnel, with clinicians inside healthcare environments, clinical systems and also analytics, AI, ML, ML big, big uh, you know, analytical platforms that can be used to extract really interesting insight from data. And through the use of the platform, we can turn out new applications really rapidly that are fully compliant with all of the regulations and, and, and requirements of this sector. So to drill down to that a bit more, what does that actually mean? Um, I'll come on to the data management aspects in, in, in a short while, but I'll start off by talking about one of the key aspects of the platform that makes it really applicable in this area. Essentially, lots of applications require the same common functionality. It's not specific to one particular type of application um, or device, and um, it certainly couldn't be considered core IPR. Given that, it's crazy reinventing the wheel if you can just pick up the essentially the components and utilize them in a space that allows you to implement them rapidly. So we have a rapid application development environment on MMDC that allows you to quickly build new product that incorporates a wide range of functionality from um, video calling and text messaging to allow clinicians to set up conversations with patients and, and work with them to um, rapid development of new software. So we have a, a, a really rapid application, a really nice editor that allows people who don't even need to be IT professionals, they can be subject matter experts to develop new applications quickly and easily. And those applications will then render either in a secure browser or they will render in um, apps on iOS, Android, and UWP. Um, the applications are sophisticated. There's lots of workflow that can be implemented. To give you an idea of the type of functionality that we have, we even have things like a really sophisticated media library so that you can, so that a clinician can essentially prescribe different types of media to different patients. The apps can be configurable on a patient by patient basis. So um, it, it's possible for clinicians to determine exactly what functionality gets sent to an individual patient as well. Um, the platform is stable, it's proven, it's compliant. We have a full technical file for it. And that means that products that use the platform inherit its compliance attributes and they can rely on the technical file of the platform to form a large part of their own technical file. Now, the rapid application development tool creates a text file that is essentially a, a plain English, well, more or less plain English description of what the application is doing. And that, and that text file is then interpreted by the platform. So that again, provides an extra level of um, documentation. That, so it's essentially self-documenting. Not only that, the whole of the process of defining the protocol uh, or setting up that, that application, um, at each stage, every change that's made is, is also documented. And not just documented, it's also timestamped and data, data user stamped as well. 
So we're providing a full audit trail through the development process with the ability to add in um, comments and also to link risk assessments to each step of the development process. So you can rapidly um, perform that we have standard forms included as well that you can access that will allow you to provide or, or to introduce risk assessments at each stage that meet ISO 14971. The um, platform itself is completely end-to-end -end encrypted and all data that are captured on it are time, date and user stamped at the point at which they're entered. So if you have a form, it's not just um, capturing the or time stamping the data at the point at which you save the form or you, you move from one form to the next, it's actually time data and user stamping each item of data as it's entered into the form. And the benefits are, are, are clear. You can get new applications out very rapidly for very much less cost as well. And also getting very rich involvement from subject matter and, um, experts is also a real advantage because that can help just eliminate some of the Chinese whispers that can occur between the require the people capturing the requirements and detailing requirements and the people who have to execute those requirements. When it comes to devices, we've partnered with ARM. ARM are obviously focused on physical hardware devices. Um, and we're working with them to develop rap designs that can be rapidly implemented into new products. And these are the designs not for the bits that would be specific to a new sensor, but for the connectivity aspects of that device. Um, not only that, we're leveraging ARM's Pelion technology, which can be used either to transfer um, data off devices, but much more importantly um, and, and usefully for transferring design files down to devices. And that's particularly useful because it allows, for example, you to have a device manufactured in China, checked using a test file for the firmware, and then you only configure the device as and when you know where it's going to go. So it then gets firmware sent to it at the point of perhaps shipment from um, the site um, from the distributor locally in the organization, or even you can have the device fire up and configure itself on, um, on delivery and on first commissioning by the, by the end user. Not only that, Pelion is very secure and it gives you a way of implementing security updates to firmware, which again is, is, is important to, uh, as a way of addressing all of the threats, the, the, cyber, the cyber threats. Coming on to data management, um, the platform sits on top of a complex data infrastructure that here in the UK straddles both the um, internet and the NHS and well, well the health and social care network. So the, uh, the network that the NHS uses internally. Um, the, we have full N NHS digital approvals for that process. We are ISO 27001 accredited, and in fact, we've just passed um, a full accreditation, a full three-day accreditation from two people for our new three-year um, accreditation. We're also ISO 13485 accredited, which we need to be for the way in which we use the platform. But we have Cyber Essentials, and we also have um, accreditation to the DSP toolkit. In fact, we've been accredited to its predecessor, the IG toolkit, since 2008 and until the fall and until they, they moved on to the DSP toolkit we were we could we could announce that we were met 100% all the requirements of the IG toolkit um, these days the DSP toolkit doesn't give you a score it just tells you whether you pass or fail um, so but the, the the compliance the the data network is very sophisticated um, it meets international compliance in multiple countries. So it actually is nuanced enough to deal with local jurisdiction requirements. Um, we manage it, we manage all of the um, aspects of the, of the operation. A, a lot of the functionality um, or, the, or the management and, and the risk management is actually automated. Um, the way in which we handle data is fully GXP compliant. Um, essentially, 
each piece of data on our system, we know when it was captured, who captured it, when they, what time it was captured. We can even identify the location where it was captured using um, GPS coordinates. And then we can track it through our system. So every byte, we know where it is at any one point in time and where it has been throughout its, its history on our platform. And, and that, again, is a real advantage because for those people who are developing devices, you can often get initial revenue by getting the devices used within a clinical trial situation before you've gathered the data that you need to sell them properly into healthcare. Um, the data management is scalable, resilient and, and fully traceable, obviously, um, but it basically meets the data security um, requirements as well that are required for, for full information governance. Um, and I, I put down that it meets MDR requirements for complex devices. We've aimed to look at a medical device, a complex medical device, in, in an interesting way, where you have, where you consider a device that creates data, it sends its data to the cloud, there it's analysed by AI, from there it goes to a clinician who may have some um, other um, alerting on certain data, and also to a patient where the results of the AI may actually decide to tell the patient to do something like contact the hospital or, you know, for example, with a glucose meter, um, tell the patient to change the insulin dose. In that sort of situation, you need the data management to be considered as part of the medical device, and we've done just that. On the outside of the platform is an open API that allows you to integrate AI and ML. And we have got multiple um, applications where we've, we've done just that. We've integrated um, M AI and we can pass data securely to a way to, to the AI systems, allow them to report it and then transfer the data back into clinical networks and even then reinsert reports into the patient, um, into the patient um, record. So, this is a, it makes um, MMDC a very useful way of, of, of enabling new AI medical devices to actually access data and get to market rapidly. And then on top of that, we've got established healthcare connections with quite a wide range of, of different third party um, systems. Not only that, we manage the product life cycle because the development is only part of the process. Once you get your product developed, you've got to manage its life cycle and make sure that everything stays compliant. And we do just that for multiple com companies. We, um, we ensure that they meet information governance and continue to meet information governance. We will capture um, reports, um, adverse reaction reports. We will manage their MDR compliance as well. And we provide all of this because we're doing it for, for multiple companies. Um, it means that we can do just this in a, a way that makes it really a very attractive um, way of essentially offloading a, um, a problem to a third party in a way that, that meets, um, that ensures best practice. And it, this is important because if you're designing a new medical device and trying to get it out there and, and into the market, there is so much to do, to do with um, making sure that your own IPR is good, that your application works well, that it meets the market requirements, that it will fit sensibly into the um, payer uh, um, network so that you, you fit it into the um, mechanisms that are used in a particular jurisdiction to remunerate healthcare um, products. And then you've got to actually get it to market and get it introduced into healthcare environments, get people to buy it. Um, there is just, there's plenty to be done. Uh, uh, managing your own IP and actually the business development aspects of what you do that to have a third party come and take away the compliance, many of the, the compliance issues is a real benefit. And that's essentially what we aim to do. So we're about managing compliance, de-risking it and um, helping people get the benefit of their IP, leverage it, get it to market much faster. 
this is one application that we've developed and in fact it is one that we've done for ourselves because we there's an element of, of needing to eat our own dog food i think um we've also got a a major um contract from nhs england to manage a or to set up and run a devices trial which is looking at getting um devices out to the over 65s um with multiple comorbidities and frailty and see whether or not we can um automate data analysis in a way that um makes that, that allows us to detect early signs of deterioration um successfully and with high specificity um, it's also used for monitoring in pregnancy ladies who are at risk of preeclampsia and making sure that while well, well, they stay at home, they're, they're safe. And if they have any um, deterioration, they're instantly logged and flagged with the maternity clinic so they can be treated. Um, it also allows us to incorporate new prescribable content to, um, to patients. And also it's a platform that we're using to gradually um, allow new devices to access, access the market. Um, essentially, each device is available to clinicians to prescribe for monitoring of patients. And this is another application. This is a, a, an application that we've um, worked on with one of our customers who has AI expertise and, and in intellectual property. Um, for them, we encapsulated an AI module that they developed um, over well, masses of um, data, massively large data set. Um, and what it does is for patients who enter COVID wards, it provides a risk assessment um, for the, the major types of complications that tend to occur in those patients. Um, and this application, as you can see, has won multiple uh, awards. Uh, in fact, it's, it's recently won another award. So it, it, it seems to be clocking up the awards in, with, with great speed, um, right product at the right time. And this application we turned out within a few weeks, literally, from um, taking the AI algorithm and encapsulating it, putting together the documentation, registering it. It was out really, really rapidly. So that's um, that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, so let me hand you back to Kevin and the um, and the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Jane. That was an absolute fascinating presentation. Uh, could I ask uh, the other presenters to switch on their videos so we can all see each other? Uh, could I ask a question to Cliff? Cl Cliff, you... Uh, we're in the business of, of manufacturing physical needle disposal systems. And the next minute you're talking about pushing information to the cloud and satisfying a totally different need. Did you bring people into the organization with the appropriate know-how and expertise, or did you find it easier to contract out that, that knowledge and expertise? I think, can you hear me, Kevin? Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think the answer to your question is I, I see um, I see data and code and, and the cloud as as tools that are an intrinsic part of of offering a product in the modern marketplace. And um, the direct answer to your question is is a little of both. So we've used a combination of external supply to build quickly, but then we have to bring in an internal resource to understand what's being built and control that architecture. Um, there's always that risk that if you leave everything in the hands of a third party, you never really own what you think you own. Um, so <clears throat> we brought in a number of medical professionals alongside a number of data specialists to bring through the solution we've got in front of us. Okay, okay. And, and, and Jane, you mentioned um, your interaction with the NHS. Mm. How do you interact with the NHS? How do you know w at which level to interact with. You mentioned the importance of clinical experts. The biggest challenge with all of us is to know how, how to engage with the NHS. You've obviously got lots of experience in that space, um, particularly it, when it comes to co-development and engaging with clinicians. It, it varies, to be frank. Um, a lot of the work that we do, to be honest, tends to be for third parties who then engage with the NHS. So we're there supporting okay. them in the background and they do the work of engagement. But that said, we're on the NHSX 
um, remote monitoring framework, the recent one that's come through. Um, so we've we've gone on to various frameworks in in the past, and regularly we actually do get approached by people in the NHS who've got ideas. So we've worked with a number of clinicians um, to develop applications, and in fact um, we've had several clinicians. Um, they tend to be incredibly busy people, actually. I'm not quite sure how they find the time, but they will, in their spare time, use our platform to develop applications. So we've had one clinician develop a dermatology monitoring application, um, another clinician who's a GP and running a large practice um, has developed an application that handles all the back office functions in his practice for, um, for the whole practice and it's essentially digitizing all of those functions, making them um, essentially implementing protocols and ensuring that throughout the practice, that it's a mega practice essentially that's being produced by combining multiple practices, that they all work to the same standards and protocols. Okay, I'm just looking at the questions and answers. We don't have any questions and answers at the moment. So you, you've obviously wowed uh, our audience. Uh, the, the topic of this uh, webinar is all about challenges. So I don't know, would, would Adrian, Cliff and, uh, and Jane, from a discussion point of view, uh, like to float what you believe to the major challenges? I'm, I'm sure Cliff adoption and the NHS must be a nightmare. Uh, but, but I just wonder what, what you feel from your experience of medtech companies, where, where the major sticking points are and where the major issues are. Because as of today, medtech companies want someone to hold the hand uh, and they want them to help them to get overcome some of these challenges. Do you have a, your views on, on where the major challenges are? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll jump in if you want, Kevin. I think the, the marketplace we sit in now is certainly a lot more receptive to digital tech coming into the marketplace and it's a direct result of all of us sitting in our own homes or offices for six months at a time trying to work out how you run a business. And that's happened to everyone, whether you're on the front line of the NHS or whether you're running a private business. And um, But I think the the piece that you highlight about transacting or, or trading in with the NHS is it's, it's complex and it's difficult. And that's because it's it's not really one, one overarching organization. It's You've got to try and satisfy the needs and wants of, of a number of people and, and uh, participate and make sure that the value is there all the way through. And it's it's a very complex business model to try and understand to the point where I think understanding it becomes very difficult to even get your head around the principle. But what I would say is that if we look at Needle Smart DVS versus Needle Smart as a technology, um, we were selling the product internationally back in February of this year. Uh, about 10, 12 countries in total, um, and we weren't participating in the NHS, and that was that was a source of significant frustration for me. Um, however, what what the marketplace has done now with with the COVID vaccination situation around the corner is has opened the door to a number of conduits. Um, I think what I find frustrating is that um, as a small business, you're able to react very quickly and offer solutions, and and you can look at problems in front of you and identify that solution to the people and um, unfortunately they can't respond in the same time frame or may be driven by uh, um, a policy or a situation that is just beyond their control. Any thoughts from Jane or, or Adrian as to the, the challenges you see for companies today? I think the biggest from our perspective is that it actually plays into directly what Jane's been talking about actually which is the the difficulty that uh, smaller startups have in particular in software. Uh, I mean, if you look at how small businesses tend to grow in software, you know, you, you create a little product, people call it an MVP, a minimum viable product, something that just about works. And then you get a little bit of revenue flowing and then you get excited, you employ your next developer and you, you put a bit more functionality and then you kind of organically grow. I think the problem is now that the moment you get into medical device territory and particularly for, for class 2A work, because all that goes completely out the window, because to, to get that certificate, you have to have done a huge amount of regulatory work up front. Uh, you can't do it as you, as you go along very easily at all. So suddenly 
you, you, you're faced with quite a large bill generally or a large amount of effort on your part right up front just at the point when you perhaps haven't got that level of investment and I think as we move into MDR that that's proving a, a real barrier to entry for some of the smaller players in the market of course for the bigger players in the market who've already got that infrastructure it's dead easy so we're starting to see this sort of almost like a sort of two-tier system uh, within the industry. Okay. Okay, um, I, I thought I had a question, but the, the, it was a statement, great session, all very interesting. So that's a, that, that's a statement. Oh, do I have a, let me just, oh. A lot of regulation standards and compliance frameworks have been mentioned today. For people starting out in this field, is there a priority order to tackle these or do they all need to be done in parallel? Can you offer any advice on how people can ensure they are developing new digital technologies, which meeting regulations and demonstrating compliance from the get go, so it doesn't trip them up later in the development cycle, or even when they are trying to launch their device? Yeah, I mean, I can answer that one perhaps. Uh, so I think the first thing is, uh, depending on what your product's doing, know from the outset what class it falls into. I would say probably, maybe twice a week, I have a conversation with a customer who, who says, we've, we've created this fantastic thing. We're just about to go to market with it. Um, we need help. They'll often ask us for DCB 129 and we'll come along and say, well, that's a medical device. Have you done any regulatory work on that? They've never heard of medical devices. And suddenly the moment they look at having to go to class 2A, their business doesn't stack up anymore. They just, as I said, my previous comment, they, they haven't, they've got an idea, they haven't got a business. So I think the most important thing is know up front and know which regulatory frameworks apply, cost those out and include those in your business model. Because if you don't, and you do try to launch later, it, you'll break your business. Um, I think that ultimately you need, you need, you need help from someone who can look at your product and say, yep, these are the regulatory frameworks that apply to a greater or lesser extent. I would say don't waste time. You know, everybody's time is valuable. Don't waste that time plowing through the wording of the medical device directive and regulation. You will drive yourself mad. Uh, let someone else do that and, and, and speak to people who are doing this on a daily basis. Okay. I would that actually as well. Uh, interestingly, a lot of the work that we get is from people who've already developed med or developed um, applications. They get a bit of traction, you know. They get lots of people hey saying, "Hey, this is fantastic," and then they hit the brick wall, which is someone in the NHS or you know wherever will say, "But we can't use this. You know, we can't buy this from you because it's not a medical device." And then they go, "But what's all this about medical device software?" And then we do find people coming to us because if you particularly got a design already that works, just re-implementing it on the platform can be a really rapid way to get over that particular problem and, and to and to address to address that, that particular issue. Okay, so um, with that, I, th I think that concludes our third and final webinar for the day. Our next webinar will be held at 9:30 on Thursday. And this will cover our third technology uh, challenge, that of technical know-how. Um, I have very much enjoyed chairing the, the last three webinars. Uh, and on Thursday, uh, I will be handing over to Tom Harvey from the CPI, who will be chairing the morning and afternoon session. So uh, a big thank you to, to Adrian, Jane and Cliff. Really appreciate the time you put into this. Uh, I hope the audience have got value and I hope they subsequently follow through with you. Um, as the topic for this webinar is regulation, I would like to reach out to any medical device company that need help with either the MDD or the MDR transition or in identifying an authorised representative with this being a legal requirement now for companies exporting to Europe from the 1st of January to contact Medilink. You really can't leave the transition to MDR or the appointment of an authorized representative any later. It's absolutely key now. Uh, and if you've got any issues, if you need any help, then uh, please approach Medilink. Um, I'm sure Tom Harvey, um, at the end of the webinars, 
and tomorrow we'll have contact links both for CPI uh, and also for Medilink. So thanks again to our speakers. Uh, you've been great. I uh, very much appreciate and value your support. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you all again at 9.30 on Thursday. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Lockett. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.